Good morning. Welcome into Herd Hat Sports Radio here on AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. I'm Ravi Lula here with my guy, DB. What's going on, man? Were you holding your breath? Could I make it two days in a row? Uh, no, you were here before me today. So I was. I rolled up and I was like, car's here. We're all yeah, good. I, s- same time, about every day. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on the same schedule. I vary a little bit depending on what kind of day I had. Yeah. Yeah. So are you what like what happens in your household in the mornings? The only variables are your dogs and insulin, right? Yes, dogs and insulin. Um this wife is pretty consistent. Well, yeah, she's asleep most of the time when I leave. Oh man, listen. <laughs> now, I'm not hating. That's part of the American dream. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not hating. She uh very few responsibilities before you even put your foot to the pedal of the gas. It's true. That's yeah. amazing. Well, so normally it's like how I slept. and Because all it really is, if I'm being totally honest here, yeah. is how long does it take me to decide I'm actually getting out of the bed? Oh, really? Yeah. I'm not a morning person. Oh, okay. I See, I am. So, yeah. And I'm not at all. I, I, I'm not I, at all. I went to, I was at the high school, I bet you three or four mornings a week. Yeah, that's early. It, like, and I didn't really, I mean, I didn't have to be there. Yeah. But um, it's just good to get the day started. And I mean, some of these coaches will figure out that, that aren't in the buildings mm-hmm. that need to be in the buildings. Obviously, the more you're in the building, oh, the yeah. better. Absolutely. Because so, it takes such a long time to to build relationships, mm-hmm. right? And And I think now more than fudge, man, maybe any time in my coaching career, like the young people are the most different. Like oh yeah, yeah. They're the most needy. They're the most different from when you were a young person and coaching, right? Because I'm going into twenty four sure. year, twenty three yeah. years, right? So yeah. probably the most needy. So from then to now, it takes the most. You can't just. It's not just because I said so. So let me expand do, on do you know what i mean let me expand on needy a little bit here right because i think people hear that word and immediately take negative connotation oh that's fine um and i don't know if you mean it negatively positively or neutral no i i sometimes i'm not responsible for people's interpretation unless they ask me a follow-up right question. that's what i'm asking um <laughs> you're good because you're sitting next to me. people in the <laughs> car are there. they're like gonna hit me up and everybody's like, right what you mean i'm asking the question for on their behalf because mm-hmm. i think i know what you mean but i want to clarify for me and for them mm-hmm. the question i have when you say needy do you mean most it's most necessary with them to have a relationship and a connection with you before they care what you say 100 percent. because a lot of times people say needy and you think coddled right sure and sometimes that's it yeah but you know what i so one thing i really really try to do Mm -hmm. is is use the words that i mean yeah Right. Like if I if I want to if I mean soft, I'm going to I'm gonna say soft. <laughs> if I want to say ding dong, I'm going to say ding dong. Yeah. Right. Like so needy. It's a it's a multitude of things. It can be. Yeah. You know, it's it's weird because I think the, the family dynamics. Are are, are very, very different than than i've than i've ever seen before and it's not just the trivial not trivial because i don't want to downplay one versus two parent or split homes or whatever i mean like involvement i mean sure. i mean where and like connectivity where you'd i'm talking about parents being involved with what the right, young yeah, people yeah. are yeah. doing with with us not with each other oh gotcha okay right so the parents are less involved in what you do more involved are more involved in what you right you, okay. you see them at youth games the, kind of the helicopter parent 100 yeah. okay it, it's at an all-time high i could see that right and and there's a there's a ton of reasons why sure. it's you know the, the internet mm-hmm. uh, social media i think it's, it's a lot easier to communicate uh, sometimes when you see people on social media or you see them out and about there's this there's this feeling that you're closer than you really are mm-hmm. uh, there's very so few you're saying things you normally wouldn't there's just fewer boundaries. Yeah. Like parents will question coaches more than ever also, because we're in the age of inquiring minds want to know. I, I, I think therefore I should say yeah. like that. That's just where we're at. So like you have to really, uh, you have to get out ahead of it. 
Well, and, and there's also, I think, this part of it where the internet for all of its wonderful things, and to a certain degree, this is a po- that's as somewhat positive, mm-hmm. but there's been a de-emphasis on expertise. Uh, yeah. Because, I, like... Well, at its core, I think the word is respect. Whether it's coaches respecting their profession and holding up their end of the sure. deal, which can help garner trust and nip it in the bud before you get people mm-hmm. that feel like you're not an expert. It's 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 parents respecting what the coaches do. It's respecting boundaries. It's it's respecting and guarding your words. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think it. I think the core word it starts with for me is is respect. And I tell people. And anybody that that's known me, especially over the last six, seven years, as I've really kind of dialed in on on who and and who I am, what I want to do, how I want to parent, mm-hmm. and I mean this with with the utmost love, right? Because I think this is a key. <laughs> Go where you're celebrated and not tolerated. Mm, yeah. If you, yeah. if you if you feel like you're being tolerated, go find something else different to do. I mean, we just saw that with Chip Kelly. Listen, right? Go find something else different to do. Go where you're celebrated and not tolerated. And and that goes for players. Mm-hmm. That goes for parents. That goes for coaches on coaching staffs across the board. I mean, that goes for relationships too, right? Well, listen, it's I it's, mean, it's lock stock, baby. Like it is a it's, it's kind of a universal. It's, it's lock stock. And it's all inclusive because I mean, look what we just saw with Chip Kelly, right? Yeah, they kept him at UCLA this year. He very much was being tolerated, yeah, yeah. not celebrated. He goes to be the OC at Ohio State. I don't know if he's celebrated, but it's a much better and, and you, position. And I think for you, him. I think you can feel it. Yeah, I, I think you can feel it. And it, no, there's it's like just, when you're being tolerated, there's a burden on you. And and sometimes, like if you're going to be the receiver, mm-hmm. y- you don't want to do the tolerating either. No. There, there were a handful of kids. Now, I can say this because I'm not using any names. A handful of kids that were going to be on the – that have been on the move at the high school level. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, our high school was in the discussion. Hey, we'd like to go to school blank. X, Y, Z, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know if you're going to be hearing from us. Like, I heard you guys want to come here, mm-hmm. but I, I, I don't think you... – <laughs> Maybe it's not a good fit. Not a good fit. So, uh, like, and, you know, these pe- people end up at other places and stuff like that. And that's cool because I want – you ultimately want young people to flourish. You mm-hmm. Go do what you want to do. But, um, you know, freedom of choice doesn't mean, you know, freedom of consequences either. Sure. So it's like the more you can set those boundaries, I just think the better off everybody will be. Usually freedom of choice means – greater consequences everybody it, it, it means accepting consequences sure it's like it's like the transfer portal i mean it's like it's the it's, great it's, power it's, great responsibility it, right, right? it's the transfer portal right yeah. that's why the transfer portal never bothered me yeah it it giveth and it taketh away the, the very first thing coach rule said where i wanted to air dap high five him mm-hmm. i didn't know him from a can of paint mm-hmm. oh man i said hey listen man it gives players it empowers players right you got you got you got to take what comes with it though yeah, I mean, there's it's you're making an adult decision at that point, right? Yeah, I think, um, and, and it, does adult always, it does yeah. always mean a safe landing, yeah, right? It, you're gonna have adult consequences, yeah, right? You you can get paid and you can get you can be compensated for your services. Uh, people can also reserve the right to say, hey, you know what, you're not holding up your end of the deal, time to go. This might not be for you, you know, there's a, I, I'm see, I'm okay with that, right. I I really am. you don't you just don't get to have both sides of it right yeah you don't because get a, what it's what it's gonna teach people to do is to stop um don't be so knee jerkish right yeah. just think things through I know this is this doesn't feel like a good spot right now it's kind of not vibing give it some time I mean it's the grass is always greener thing right like it's people always assume that a different situation is better not always a lot of people often assume a different situation mm-hmm. is better. When a lot of times that's not the case. You just can't see the flaws in the other situation. Yeah. When you're in the nitty gritty, it's kind of like you can't see the forest through the trees. 100%. And, you know, speaking on this topic, because we were from Glenn Thomas yesterday. Yeah. Right? That, that's he's the one that got me rolling. Yeah. On this whole, well, <laughs> this whole little eight minute thing right here. So the thing that I 
kind of took away the biggest thing I took away from his little uh, press conference yesterday. It's not little; it's like twenty minutes. And long. we'll and we'll we'll play some bites for you. Yeah, was the the dynamic between him and Marcus Satterfield mm-hmm. because you you want to talk about being celebrated versus tolerated? If are you going to use that now? You can. Yeah, I'm I'm stealing it. Just, so, just all all good in the name. Adopting it. We're it's a cool feeling. You know what I mean? Um, I used to say you don't want to be somewhere where. You make wanted. you feel like you're hard to love. Yeah. That's what I used to say, um, which is, I think, the same thing, right? Um, but doesn't sound as cool on a t shirt. Yeah. It's a little more like, it's a little more like on the therapy couch than it is like a, talk, a sports talk show. Stop staring at me, Shane. It's more this, this, and this. Did he get a, did he get a booster seat? I feel like I can see him through the window. <laughs> I know you said I look much thinner, Shane, but I didn't get any taller. Oh, you guys want to talk about him. That's so I, should, I shouldn't be able to see you. <laughs> I haven't gotten any taller since like eighth grade. It's fine. That's all right. Um, I was I was an early grower, and then it's just like, we're done here. Um, Too much testosterone. My dad's like 5'3". I'm, I'm lucky I got this tall. Does, does my seat warmer count as a booster seat? I think it might, yeah. I think it boosts you up there. You got a couple extra inches there, bud. Wowzer. Uh, anyway, Glenn Thomas was talking at a press conference yesterday, and the, the thing that I thought was the most interesting was him kind of describing his relationship with Coach Satterfield mm-hmm. because it would be really easy to be sat right now and feel like you're being tolerated, not celebrated, if you're listening to what's happening on the outside, right? Because I think that's how most fans, quote-unquote, view Marcus Satterfield. They are tolerating him for another year. Right. Right, right. That, that, yeah, good point. So this will be all in, this that that line will be all inclusive for a long time. Yeah, probably. <laughs> right. Yeah, I get the sense where you could make the case for 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 Coach Sat feeling like that because I've heard pe- Shane. Did I kick myself out? I've heard people. You're back. Clamoring not just for, uh, you know, not just for Glenn Thomas, which I feel like we knew was happening well before it happened. Are you thinking about Glenn Close? No, she's an actress. Are you talking Shane, about... isn't there a Glenn Thomas like the Eagles or the Doors? Or I think Purdue? Glenn Fry. Are you thinking about Rob Thomas? Who's he? Matchbox 20. I went to school with Rob Thomas. Track. Yeah, and he doesn't sing smooth Gosh, with Santana, he was, though. He was gifted. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> he was. He and Steve Gort. Anyway. But right. you, you kind of got the sense with people clamoring for Glenn Thomas, for people clamoring for the Dana Holgerson thing. For whatever that Satterfield, at least externally, was being tolerated, not celebrated. Mm. And but you then you go listen to Coach Rule, you listen to what Glenn Thomas said about their working relationship and how they uh how he views Sat. And it it is kind of it it's a little unusual for me because you have to really trust someone to be okay with that position. Mm-hmm. Like in it, I know they'd worked together before, right? Obviously they had a similar setup at temple and you know, you, you, I kind of just like, okay, that was a long time ago. They've each had a lot of different jobs since then. I'm wondering, okay, how is, is it'd be really easy if you're Marcus Satterfield to be looking over your shoulder a lot, right? To be being like, Oh, is this guy going to start calling plays? Am I like, how long do I have before this is a problem? Right. But I think there's a really interesting part in here about the way that Glenn Thomas was talking about Marcus Satterfield. In fact, they've known each other for 20 years. Like you have to trust somebody so much Mm -hmm. for that not to become dysfunctional in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I don't. off of such and such and him and such and such and him mm-hmm. and all i all i would tell all i would tell our guys is up, upstairs or whatever i'm like doesn't matter i i, I don't care i trust such and such mm-hmm. i trust such and such i as long as i feel like they have my best interest at heart 
doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. You, you, you want me to play off of, you want me to do like, just I'm, I'm cool. Right. And I think because I do, tr if I, I can't work with you, if I don't trust you. Number one, mm -hmm. but if I do, it, that's, that's what I'm all in. Like you could tell me anything, right? How many times have you cha not changed, but whether it's the layout of the show or something you want to talk about, or, you know, over the weekend when we're talking about maybe lineup change or schedule change mm -hmm. or whatever, it, do I give you any pushback? No, and I say, nah, it's not a good idea. And it's not that I'm being, it's not that you're mowing me down. No, I, 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 tr I trust the judgment. Now, if I don't, I'd say something. Yeah. And, right. And sometimes you'd be like, oh, let me think about that. Right. F for, for, for coaches, mm -hmm. like f for coach Martin to, to come get me in 12. Yeah. Right. Um, he has to trust me because there's stuff that comes with me being on your staff. Some of it good, some of it bad. Right. Yeah. You gotta be pretty secure in who you are mm -hmm. for, for coach Lamangi to, to come in to West side. Now he worked with me before, mm -hmm. right. He asked me to take some roles Yeah, that I was kind of like, Ooh, I trust you. So we're rolling with it. Even though it may have been easy for me. And he said it clearly, especially in year one. He goes, hey, I, I want to do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. I need you to do your thing, be who you are, and, and let just just trust me on this, okay? Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. Right? So, And if that had come from someone else. Or a different place. Yeah. If right? you had been in a different place in your life, in your or, or him and my connection with him, right? right? Or if so, that request was coming from someone else, that goes over differently. So let me land the plane for you with Coach Rule and Coach Satterfield and, and Coach Thomas. Mm -hmm. Coach Rule said about Coach Thomas during his press conference after signing day. He said it boils down to what I just trust him. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll go back to the story that I told kind of off to the side that I thought was an interesting disclaimer or a term of in, uh, words of affirmation to 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 describe Coach Satterfield. I was asking Coach Rule about Coach Sat. I just met these guys and some of the other guys had been in the school and and Coach Rule went into detail about how much he trusted Coach Sat. Loyal to the soil, first call he made. Mm -hmm. I knew that Coach Rule had called Coach Sat after the Clemson win and he knew right away and he said didn't matter how much he was ready to go mm -hmm. like they need each other they don't like to spend too much time away from each other yeah and I, I it's just interesting right so I went back and somehow came up with coach rule again and again he was talking about loyal to the soil how he trusted him he said he's done so many things he's coached O-line he's done quarterbacks he's done wide receivers he's played wide receiver mm -hmm. um obviously tight ends tight ends yeah. and, he, and he but this was interesting and I said this out loud and I didn't know if it was a ringing endorsement but sure enough as as last year played out mm -hmm. having to evolve and change the offense and have some conviction and not waver because mm -hmm. it had been easy to just be a leaf blowing in the wind oh as an yeah OC last year yeah. right and I said, you can't get Nebraska's progress without getting some of Coach Satterfield's personality, mm -hmm. right? For all the things that we're upset with and and, and struggling with, his resolve mm -hmm. is ringing through to this team, right? It's remember I told you, Rezac said you don't get this life without me in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that that's right. that that's yeah. that story. So he said, you know, he said, Coach Sat, he's, he said he's the type of coach where you could take play calling duties from him tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And his job isn't going to change one bit. Yeah. A and I just, at the time, because I don't know anything. It's well, I still don't. Mm -hmm. It's February. I'm like, is that a good thing? <laughs> like that you're using, taking play calling responsibilities with. But but it's now that I've watched this whole family dynamic. Yeah. yeah. He's just telling you. He's riding. He's riding for the brand. Yeah. He trusts Coach he, Rule implicitly. He, he is riding for the. I can't tell you yeah. how important that is. Yeah. I am for the brand. Well, and that sets the culture for the players too, because they see that. Hey, right. So I had a I had a crazy conversation with um, with DJ over the holidays, mm -hmm. and it, I'm not gonna get one of the questions. He's like, you know, the one of the he said, DB. Let me tell you one of the things I'm struggling with. I see this, 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 and this, and I'm thinking to myself, man, mm -hmm. is he is he for the brand or is he for himself? Mm -hmm. And it's like, there it is again. Yeah. If you're if you're for the 
the the brand. It's the it's the name on the front versus name on the back thing, right? It, it like reveals that's itself, and we just talk about it so flippantly and mm-hmm. casually. And uh, the, hey, man, like family's family. Yeah, and ultimately, that's the way that Nebraska has to build this bad boy to offset all the other crazy dynamics of 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 NIL and mm-hmm. the and the transfer portal and what other schools are doing and having a losing record, right? Like you have to hunker down and trust one another. What recruits does Coach Rule gravitate towards? The guys that commit to him before proof is in the pudding. Yep. It, it, it's all it's all the he said that a bunch of times right the guys, a, right the guys that the guys that bought into him before the repetition and consistency going. of yep. the message yeah is the same and the coaches sound what other head coach is picking up the phone to give a ringing endorsement of another guy for another job and it could be at his expense yeah I told you the real magic happened in the 90s when you could cheer for other players and it may be at your own expense. Yeah. Yeah, I got to be able to say, go LP, go. Yeah. Right? You know, t Phrase has got to be able to say, hey, man, Brooke, man, hey, air dap. Yeah. It's just, it's the real magic happens when you can cheer for other people and it may be at your expense. Mm. Uh, we, Brett, hold on real quick. We're going to. We've only got a minute, about a minute left here before the hard out. So, Brett, stay on the line for us. We will pick you up as soon as we come back. But I want to let you know, coming up on the show today at 8 a.m., we've got the one, the only Kevin Kugler, who uh, does play-by-play for everything. 8.45, we've got Greg Anderson. He is a ad expert with uh, Bailey Lowerman. He's their CEO. Uh, we want to talk about some of the Super Bowl ads. And then at 9, we're going to talk to our guy, Matt D. Marinas. From the white and blue review a favorite of both db and mine yeah we will talk to him about creighton their upcoming game against georgetown tonight and then of course we're gonna have our first ever heard at hot seat with my guy db here we'll see what we can do that's the show coming up for today brett hold on to the line there on the warhorse sportsbook hotline and we will get right back to you here on heard at sports radio am 590 espn omaha espn tri cities of course on twitter facebook and youtube as well Welcome back to Herd at Sports Radio here on AM590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Shane Schilberg producing for us. I'm Robbie Lula, DB here with me. We are, what is it, Tuesday? Tuesday? Uh, Yeah, going Tuesday. up on, on a Tuesday. Tuesday. I went turnt up Tuesday on the uh Oh, you were turned today. Yeah. Yeah, no, no disrespect. Cause I talked like I talked to you mm-hmm. over the last five months quite a bit. Yeah. I didn't early see Shane. That's right. I missed Shane. <laughs> I, I really did. I, I'm I'm glad you're you know it was a nice little separation. Yeah, I, I mean see, I see you still have that and then the terrible night. facial hair, but <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Whatever. I looked at, and then Mike. after a few months, I probably did miss you. I looked at Micah last night. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, you have a little bit of hair on your lip. Yeah. He's like, you like that? He's, huh? he's going a little mustache on you. He asked me if I could set the weight bench up. Yeah. Yeah. He's that guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's you know he'll sneak in curls in the morning and takes his okay. little protein drinks. Okay. We, this, see, I knew I liked that kid. <laughs> yeah, he's different. But you heard it again with uh, Coach, Coach T. And it's it's strange, isn't it? Because you know what you hate? It's it's funny. Mm-hmm. And maybe I'm hearing what I want to hear. Okay. Do you not hear? For all the humility and deferring, mm-hmm. doesn't he come across as highly confident? Oh, yeah. There, listen, there's a difference. <laughs> there's a difference between being humble and not being confident. A lot of people think not being confident makes you humble. Uh-huh. And that's not true. <laughs> And a lot of people think you can't be humble and uh, be confident. Uh, That's not true either, right? You can be both, but it's a very fine line to walk, right? Of not letting and and he talked about this with Sat, where he goes, ego is not part of the equation, mm-hmm. right? I just don't think you can be around Coach Rule. I don't think and- you can stay around Coach Rule because I think if you're not about that life, you get gone pretty quick. Yeah. Be- and, and honestly, I don't think you would want to stick around. I mean, I've been in places in my life where, like, I wasn't, you know, maybe in the best place. And I wasn't trying to do the whole, like, 
culture, everybody for everybody thing. And I didn't want to be there. Just keeping it 100 out of the gates, right? And I didn't want to be there very long. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, I've been, you mentioned the, like, rooting for people. At your own expense. At your own expense. There's not very many people in my life that I'm about that. Like, that I'm I'm like that with. Mm -hmm. Right? There's, it's a real small number. Because Robbie likes him some Robbie. Right? Like, that's. I get it. You know, and so, you know, the the thing that you brought up that is something I've never understood, never, because I just can't imagine. Okay, I'm uh, now I'm wrapping my mind around the dynamics of that because I know some because you've told me some things about it, right? You mentioned the Tommy and Brooke thing. Yeah, I know that there were people in that locker room Uh that wanted Brooke to start, right? I know there were people in that locker room that wanted Tommy to start, right? You've literally got two factions in the locker room. And it did not matter. Nope. That's the craziest thing in the world to me. Like to have two very separate opinions. And because like anytime you hear about that, it's as part of a conversation of how a season got off the rails. It's like, ah, this group kind of wanted to be with this guy. This other group kind of wanted it to be this guy. And they could never really come together. And the whole thing fell apart. So that's those, the only time you hear that so conversation. Those personal opinions are fine. That's yes. just human nature. But you know what the non-negotiable is if you're going to be a part of that culture? You have to you have to still maximize. That's the part to me that is absolutely nuts. Like you, I don't that might be the rarest thing that you guys accomplished. Uh, it, it just it's not it's not magic if it's all you know. It's not magic, but it is rare. Uh, maybe like that's I I, I'm sure that there are several businesses. Even families, because mm-hmm. it's this is a family dynamic that I'm talking. Yeah, about. absolutely. Right. Yeah. Like if, if if I'm over at, you know, Garden West JCC mm-hmm. and, you know, my sister is on her second grant from NASA. Mm-hmm. I have. Does, I, does she know my uncle? <laughs> she she actually did get a couple grants from NASA. She's a genius. But anyway, well, my, my uncle works at NASA. That's what I was asking. <laughs> so I have to. And, and, and I know my parents may feel a certain way, and I may yeah. joke about her being the golden child or yeah. whatever. But I, I still I root for her. Yeah. Right. Or, um. But that's let, that's, let's take let's take my 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 brother right yeah. who who may have wanted to to I don't know if he ever did or not, but to be married or have the family dynamics, and then look at some other people in our in our household and be like, oh, you know what, I want that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna root for mm-hmm. him or her. Yeah. Like so, I'm talking about a I'm talking about a component like when you. When you really want the best for somebody, that's usually relegated to family. Mm-hmm. But the closer you have, the closer the culture is to family, mm-hmm. the better typically the business is run. And that even means the infighting mm-hmm. where you can't say anything about my brother. Only I can because I'm his brother. Yeah. I can't be over at KB Building Services or or Nato Development or or Mutual of Omaha or or Lutheran Family Services or, or wherever mm-hmm. else and let other people speak bad about the family outside the family, but internally, like we can grow each other. That that's just like Nebraska. Like okay, when, but, but let me the, the, the fam they may be thinking the same things that some of the fan bases are thinking. Yeah. Some parts of the fan base. Oh, my God. I can't believe you called the same play on third and seven where you emptied the backfield Mm. and went gun. I can't believe we went shotgun on fourth and short again. Coach Rule isn't going to say that to you. For sure. But but he's going to have that conversation. So those characteristics. You handle it in-house. Or still in-house. So let me. me, I think there's there's (laughs) something here, though, because. The, I think it's rarer than you think it is in families too. Maybe, like I, I think. Oh, I'm sure it's it's it wrote. Yeah, you're probably because right. Because usually, let me let me from a let me go let me go corporate standpoint on you here, right? Usually, when people are are talking about, yeah, we're a family, mm-hmm. they use that to excuse toxic behavior. Okay, so not like Sister Sledge or no, 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 okay. not not we, uh, no, oh, okay. not, not not that. They use a lot of times in corporate or non-family situations. They use the term, oh, we're a family to excuse their own toxic behavior because it's like, oh, we're a family. So, yeah, I'm going to ask you 
to work 80 hours a week with no extra compensation. Or I'm going to ask you to do X, Y, and Z. That's not part of your job description. Or I'm going to ask you to pick up the slack for somebody we fired because we don't feel like hiring somebody else, Mm -hmm. right? Like they use the, oh, we're a family. You got to, you got to help out here to excuse toxic behavior. You know, what's funny. Yeah. God, this is from this again, from a sports standpoint, just Friday night, I'm watching the hoops game with one of our assistant coaches Mm -hmm. and he had to leave a little bit early because he's got two young girls and, and, uh, his, his wife's a nurse. So anyway, so he's leaving mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm like, Hey, you know, coach right later, whatever. So a couple of minutes later, he sends me a, a, a tweet from a, a high school, another high school. Mm-hmm. So a competitor mm-hmm. in essence. Yeah. And he goes, do you think we should do this? And I'll show you the tweet. Any no, here I can just say I don't care. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, so the the tweet was, "Hey, can we help you be developed?" And he they did like this tweet of of all these players going to college. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to play with or against them, and 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 yeah, you know, kids, whatever. And I and I text him back. I go, I want to like and retweet that so bad, mm-hmm. but it would look awkward. Coming from coming from another school. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And he gives me kind of the question marks, and I'm like, I admire it. Yeah. Uh, defend yourself. Ride for the <laughs> brand. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. Like I, I thought. I was like, Hey, man. Like, clap. Like I. That's the ultimate clapback. Here's- and and it and I want and I didn't have the courage. I, I didn't have the courage to openly like it, to even, endorse it, even though I'm like, yeah, man, like that, that's, that's, I would do that too. Here's where it gets tricky is when people, people often will ask you to ride for the brand when they're riding for themselves. Uh, that's have, where yeah, it gets toxic. That's where you need to surround yourself with people that are, that are smarter than you, you. do. And, and I tell people all the time, man, stop seeking counsel from the less wise. And that's where the trust comes in. <laughs> like, the problem is a lot of people are not that trustworthy. Like a good guy at the club can't be asking the, the married guy how to, <laughs> how to you know, operate at the club and vice versa, right? And vice versa is certainly true. We'll wrap up our number one coming up next. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> wrapping up our number one here on Herd at Sports Radio AM 590 ESPN Omaha ESPN Tri Cities. Want to remind you real quick that's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. The Om- your Omaha Mavericks men's basketball team trying to win themselves a conference title. Have a couple big games this week. You and oh, <laughs> I know you're a big Omaha guy. You already know. I stopped a little dude Sunday. Yeah. This kid's probably nine years old. <laughs> he plays for this itty bitty junior. I think it was junior Mustangs because they were in all blue. They, yeah. were the little, they were the little guys playing so, after us. So the good ones, the junior it, Mustangs. Oh, stop. <laughs> hey, little dude had on a, a Omaha hat, yeah. like a stocking cap. And, okay. and I'm team stocking cap number one. Yep. It, it was, it had the big O number yeah. two. And on the back, it had the the hockey sticks crossed. Nice. I was like, "Hey, man, you <laughs> you don't know me from Adam, but I love your gear." <laughs> this little dude looked up at me like, "Stranger danger, was, stranger <laughs> danger." <laughs> you look at me and be like, "I am not getting in your van." Hey. Um, <laughs> they had their gear. I right, listen. I'm all in on the Mavs. The man. Mavs have South Dakota on the 15th. That's Thursday. They've got SDSU, who's leading the summit right now on Saturday. Both are 7 p.m. tip-offs at Baxter Arena. Go to omavs.com to get your tickets. Go support the Mavericks and see what they're doing. Man, you got to go see Frankie Fiddler, if nothing else. Hey, so- That dude's a bucket. Like, go watch this team. Coach Crutch has them going. Like, they're trying to win the summit, trying to get their first ever NCAA tournament bid. Go out and support the squad. Uh, humble, like, humble brag. I, you know me. Been in on Frankie Fiddler from day one. Oh, even, yeah. Even in high school. Yeah, no, I, I know. And and I, and people didn't understand it. They're like, oh, you know, this, that, and the other. I said, I don't care about any of that. Mm-hmm. Off the dribble, whatever. I said, you know my favorite thing about Frankie Fiddler? Every time he steps on the court, he's trying to give it to you. Yeah. He is the ultimate competitor. And it wasn't always easy for him. Yeah. Right. 
it wasn't rainbows and butterflies in his personal life. He's the younger brother of another good player Mm -hmm. in the same, like there's lots. And every time (laughs) I remember watching him and John Tonjes and, and like there was a right cell was part of that deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Max Polk. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there were some guys with some swag yeah, that some were playing in the Metro, mm-hmm. and th- he just refused to take a back seat. Yeah. And I'm like, go ahead then, Frankie. You're my dude. <laughs> you know, it kind of reminds me not to, not to you know, play nepotism here, but the first few times I saw Caleb play football live, yeah. I was like, oh, he's out to mess people up. Like, he's, <laughs> he's out there. Like you said, he's out there to give it to people. Yeah. He's, like, he's not out there just to play football. He's not out there to win. He's out there to give it to you. He's a quietly. He's a means. He's not. I, I he's don't, a killer. I don't worry about him. No, like that dude. I that's the thing that I didn't know about him. You know, because he doesn't talk. Well, because he doesn't talk, and like seeing him live versus seeing him on TV is a different vibe. I agree. Like it was a that was the biggest thing I learned about him this year. I was like, oh no, he's an assassin. Yeah. Like that's that's a um I I can I can ride with that dude. And I'm and I'm thinking I'm like. Okay, Nebraska's putting themselves in position to make their postseason run. Mm-hmm. Creighton had arguably their most impressive win, uh, especially on the road, which nobody appears to be able to do at a, at a high level. Isn't it crazy? It's wild. I was going back and forth with my butt. Uh, I was talking to DeGenera Aaron, and he's like, I can't remember how he asked me, but he said something about, Oh, it was Nebraska was playing on the road. Oh gosh. And I think it was I think it was Northwestern. I, I yeah, something like that. But anyway, yeah. He's like, man, what is going on? Can we finally get one on the road? And I'm like, nah, probably not. I'm like, look, buddy. <laughs> no, I kind of <laughs> here, full disclosure. I felt decent about that game. Yeah, that was the worst one. That might have been the worst one. So you know what I didn't expect? Yeah. I didn't think they were gonna stop doing the little like the careless stuff. Yeah. It's, Casual with the basketball, man. And Northwestern the bad turnovers. So many passing lanes in that game. I thought it was Oboy from Memphis. Did you watch <laughs> Memphis this weekend? And he had like seven steals, and they were clean. Yeah, they were like just stepping into passing yeah, lanes. I'm like, like oh, what is? Mine. I'm that's like, good. what are you? What are you doing? But anyway, <laughs> a little it, pass fake goes a long way. <laughs> so we're, you know, as they're setting themselves up, and and the summit is gettable this year. It is. It is. Nobody's. No, I don't think there's like. SDSU isn't dominant. No. That's not one of those, you know, that's not one of those teams that you're looking at the NCAA tournament and be like, oh man, I'm picking them in an upset in the first round. You know, so it's like, you know, nobody's nobody's streak in the conference is greater than two, whether it's wins or losses. Mm-hmm. So that just lets you know, man, any night out. It is, it's a well balanced conference. What's with the road thing, though? I don't is, know. Is it I, Animal Hawk? I what would. a rush. <laughs> It's just hard to be road worse. Well, and I wonder, I wonder, and maybe I'm grasping here because I'm just sort of thinking about this as we're talking. I, I, Are you traumatized still about the Niners in Allegiant Stadium? No, I mean, listen, that that it doesn't matter where it happened. I'm traumatized because of Patrick Mahomes, not because of where they played the game. By the way, when we spent our little 60 seconds yesterday talking about Romo, which had nothing to do with anything because it wasn't a Romo venting session, I didn't. Do you know real time? I didn't know what he did. I didn't know he. I didn't know he trampled over the, the ending of the game. He does well. I didn't, it was it was it was trending. I didn't know because I saw an article yesterday. Yeah, that he may be done, and I was like, "What happened?" Because even De Marinas, who we'll talk to, yeah, he kind of like kept it moving because we're like obviously we're group texting obviously or we're group texting during the game. Yeah. He goes, gosh, he was fine for a half. I don't know what happened. No, he fell apart in the second half. But I don't, but I didn't real time. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk to Kugler. I don't know. He won't speak bad about a, a peer, probably. But we both we he, can ask him about the proper dynamics of how that's supposed to play out. So I was so disgusted that it happened. Mm-hmm. I didn't even pay it any mind. Mm. Like real time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't I, I wasn't like, ooh, he probably should have laid out for that and let the Chiefs fan like he probably robbed them of like I didn't think that real time. Yeah. But boy, our people were livid. I didn't think about it at all because I was just You're mad too, right? Yeah, I'm mad because of how yeah. the game ended. Yeah. And so I'm not listening to him at all. Right. Like I it does I like I don't even remember like I, I'm sure you're right. And I remember him stepping on Nance the rest of the entire broadcast.
Hey, good morning, Ravi. Damon, welcome back. Thank you. Brett with two T's. Yeah. What's so, up? So, uh, real quick, par- uh, we'll be up there in Omaha first week of March. Oh, to, nice. Uh, talk to West Side. So, oh, is-, is that right? Come on down. Da-da-da-da. Yeah, Parker. Parker, the the main push is Parker said that he saw congratulations, Micah got invited to that homegrown camp, and he said, uh, "Dad, if we lived in Omaha, I could get invited too." Yeah, look, o- like, always looking for a quality quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, just to hype on him real quick, he did dunk it in a seventh grade basketball game. Oh my oh, goodness! Jeez. Yeah, yeah, okay, well, uh, let, 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 let me know when you get in town. <laughs> But, hey, I just was thinking, like, when you guys, my mind went this way on that coaching talk. Like, I feel like that's more of an external conversation on coaching, right? The criticism on Satterfield or rules trust because of the culture we live in. Like, it's not okay anymore to say I'm good at something. Mm. And I trust this dude to do his job because I'm secure with myself. And I'm kind of good at what I do. Yeah. So I'm going to surround myself with good people. And that's on us. Plus, we, we live in a culture now that's like, let's talk about it instead of just being about it. And it seems like with Coach Rule, Coach Satterfield, we're really successful coaches at any level. They'd rather just say, hey, I trust this dude. I love him. He's one of us. And then we're just going to be quiet and go to work. Mm. And that's kind of a thing that we're – we're missing, and that's on like us as fans, I think, more or media to keep clamoring and hammering coaches. I think that's why some coaches just leave. Yeah. Because it turns into a toxic environment or kids, because it's like, dude, I'm putting the work in. I just, this guy's better. I'm not getting my shot. And they're like, I don't want to deal with it anymore. I'm out. Mm. Like, that's, that's where I think the, the miss is one, one, when, we, when we look at like the why. 100% man and let me know when you get into town real quick on that with coach rule yeah when he brought the whole group in to see CJ mm-hmm. uh, a couple weeks ago the conversation had gone on for probably 15 18 minutes maybe even longer mm-hmm. and he, there was like this weird silence and he said there was a little bit of a segue and he goes hey make no mistake we're gonna win at the highest level I believe in this, 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 and this, and this guy in the room. Make no mistake, we will win. I don't know. It's like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. I'm pretty secure. I feel like I'm pretty good at what I do. Let's talk about why I think um, this is going to happen. And the whole dynamic of the conversation changed. Coming up next, we've got Kevin Kugler, who does what he does at a pretty high level as yeah. well. The best. Here on Herd at Sports Radio. Kicking off hour number two here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Try cities I'm Ravi Lula, DB here with me. Joining us on the War Horse Sportsbook Hotline is Kevin Kugler, who does play-by-play for just about everything. Kevin, how are you this morning? Ravi, I'm great. I, I have a few concerns. Um, okay, and I'm and I'm and mainly they center around you, and I'm I'm kind of worried. The new guy that you brought on. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I'm taking I a don't big wanna, risk here. I don't want to spread any rumors, but at one point, at one point, I heard he killed someone. So I just, wow. I just want to make sure you're, you're sitting on that for 10 years of the background that you're dealing with here with this individual. I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's true. I heard it on the radio one time and I, just it's stuck with me ever since it's you know and i've watched his meteoric rise and i hear him in the booth and i think you know is greg sharp in trouble (laughs) is ravi in trouble what do we have here so i just really it's it's my job to warn the people that are closest to him that at one point he apparently killed someone so that's that's all i'm gonna say well kevin i i can't (laughs) <laughs> that's what we're on this morning okay, okay. I, I appreciate the okay. heads up i appreciate the concern that's what i've got shane here for stop to be- encouraging shane's him. here to protect me in case something goes down shane's in tears over there 
Yeah, that's that's the one thing I've always said about Shane is if I am in trouble, I want Shane there in my corner to protect me. That's what I'm hoping for. I mean, you know, prototypical build of a bodyguard over there, I think. I think that's yeah. fair. Yeah. So he's still he's sneaky fast. Yeah, At yeah. his age, he's sneaky fast. Still sitting on phone books over there. I think wiry is the term we like to use. For people yeah, Shane yeah that's good. K2, I know you're the, the, the consummate pro, right? Obviously, well, the best in the, the best in the, <laughs> best in the business at what you do. But how, how easy or hard is it? Like when you're listening to broadcasts, especially on big stages, because I miss I and I usually don't, but I miss the whole last play of the game at the Super Bowl, right? And and I was too busy worrying about like how'd you get open or did you take the ball first? I I miss what happened with that exchange. But then I read social media yesterday and it was still trending well in to last night. Real time, as a guy that does what you do, did you, were you thinking, was that cringy for you? It wasn't cringy. I mean, it's, look, everybody's style is different and everybody's partnership in the booth is different. And so you're going to have, Romo is an excitable individual and, you know, Nance was, Nance was ready. He was on the call and Romo pounced a little quicker than I probably would have loved as a play-by-play guy. But those <laughs> two, those two like each other. They get along while they love each other. They said so at the end of the broadcast. So, I mean, I, I am assuming that all is well. Um, I just, I, I, you know, it was, Big crowd moments. You let the crowd talk. There are just things that I could say that wouldn't be as powerful in the moment as that. And it's not the same event, but we did Purdue Northwestern a couple of weeks ago at Mackey Arena, and the place is going crazy. And we didn't talk for 90 seconds. Now it's not the Super Bowl with 120 million people watching. Yeah. It's a basketball game on a Wednesday night in the Big Ten <laughs> Conference, but the concept is the same. The notion of there are a lot of cool things happening in this building right now. Mm. And I really think since COVID where I did a season of games with nobody in any building, mm. I really appreciated the crowd more. And I, and I like the idea of if I'm sitting on my couch at home is something. Giving the moment a chance to be the moment. And that's, you know, and I, and, and I, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't, but I really do think in big moments, that's a cool thing. And if I'm a fan, I'm hooping and hollering on my couch or in my living room, I'm not really paying attention to what's being said on the broadcast. So it's almost better for you as a broadcaster to get your point across if the hooping and hollering has died down a little bit before you jump in and say, what you're going to do. They weren't going to go right off the air. You never at the end of a play like that go, and that'll do it. Goodbye. <laughs> I, so, I, you you're going to have time to analyze it. You know how consistent you are. I remember this is probably 07, maybe 08. And I'm, and I'm picking your brain and you said general <laughs> rule of thumb. If you don't have anything to enhance to the enhance, enhance the broadcast, don't say it. And I was like, well, and, I mean, or, or, and then you said, give, give people a reason for the cutaway. Yeah. Like, if well, not, I mean, then don't if, do it. If you are, if you are someone now radio, this is a little harder to do because if you just go and Mahomes rolls out throws, and then you just stop because the crowd's going nuts. That, that doesn't quite work. Cause the guy in the car is going, what happened? <laughs> Why are you not telling me? But on TV, Jackpot, Chiefs win, you know, they're in Vegas. And, you know, then then you can lay out a little bit more. You know, that's it's all so subjective. And you saw that in the reviews and in the commentary. I, I really thought Tony Romo and Jim Nance had a fine broadcast. I, my gosh, I can't even imagine a stage with 120 million people watching. In week six this year, yeah. we had a game with 26 million people watching. And it was the most watched game since the Super Bowl. And it's that was what 
six times the amount of people <laughs> watching that game. It's absurd. It's insane. It's the last communal event we have as a society. I saw like everybody watches the Super Bowl, and it's really cool. But in that, but because of that large communal event, everybody's going to have an opinion. I think nine out of the top eleven, or eight out of the, la- the Super Bowl wasn't included, so it's eight out of the last ten most viewed things in the in North America were eight of them were NFL related. Is that it? Uh, how did the, that happen? The NFL is the NFL is the biggest thing in the world. Well, in, in at least our world, mm-hmm. I realize there's a larger world past North America, but it's the biggest thing that we have in the United States as a sports crazed society. And I'm sure it's gambling related. I'm sure there's gambling ties to it, but it is, it is here's here's the thing we are and I've always believed this with football mm-hmm. which is what I think makes has, gives football staying power. We as a busy and now ADD type society have the attention span of a gnat. So we want something that we can I can focus on football one day. I can commit Sunday or Saturday depending on what my flavor of football is. And then I don't have to think about it the rest of the week if I don't want to as a fan. Mm-hmm. I go about my week I deal with my family, I deal with my wife, the cat, the dog, you know, tracking down murderous sports talk hosts, anything you want to do. You you spend your week doing that, and then you come back to football on a Sunday, and you're like, all right, I can spend three hours on this football game, and then I'm done again. You can commit as much time or as little time as you want to it. I love baseball. You know that, but yep. baseball is 162 games. That's a novel. You've got to spend a lot of time on your novel basketball is an 82 game season in the NBA. That's a long time to commit. And half the time, you're not sure who's actually playing on any given night. It's just, there's a long <laughs> season ahead and football is something that you can spend one day a week on and be done with it. Football is the, the TikTok video of, of the sports calendar basically is what you're it saying. is. It is. It, it's really, it's really a, Hey, I'm going to watch football and then I'm done. And it's the perfect thing for us as a, and look, even as you're watching the game, you can be watching TikTok because there's a burst of activity mm-hmm. and then there's a lull. Mm-hmm. Oh, time for a video. Burst of activity, lull. I mean, it's a great sport anyway, but it's the perfect sport for what we've evolved in as a consuming public. You, We're ahead. talking to Kevin Kugler, play-by-play voice of everything. Um, <laughs> Kevin, I will say it's, it is a little bit easier for you because you've never really worked with a super excitable pl- color commentator. You know, like Nick Boz, very <laughs> reserved. <laughs> So it's probably you, you haven't had the challenges that, that Jim Nance has, right? No, I mean it's it's it, it was it's uh it's easier now, yeah. But, I mean I I I've worked I worked with great former Husker kickers before. Oh. That, uh, that's sometimes a challenge. Wow. Um, I've, hey, I've l- l- lunch lunch is off. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wrap. <laughs> Uh, no, it, you know what? It, it's everybody's excitable in their own way, which is which is great. I, you know, I work with Mark Sanchez 18 weeks out of the year, and Mark brings a youthful exuberance and energy to the booth that few match, in my opinion. And I and, and I love him, and I love him for it, and I love working with him. We spend a third of our year together. Mm-hmm. I mean, Damon Damon can tell you. Imagine spending a third of your year with me. Mm-hmm. I mean, that would be. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be painful. It would be a very painful. My wife can attest to that. She's like, "Oh, it's August. Please leave and go do football somewhere." But but so how I don't co- have to see you anymore. How cool is it though? And I this is I'm not like gonna ask you to fawn over yourself, but generally speaking, I, I, we and we said this in like the first sec, second segment. Like when you're good at what you do and like you're secure, it gives you versatility in terms of who you're working with. Like you've gone, you can do Lofton or Malone or or Sanchez and you're like the, you're the barometer, right? The compass. So you've got to kind of set the, 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 the tenor. Do you embrace that? Like, is that fun? Is it, or is it like, Oh, it gives me another chance to test my skills. Cause those, all those aforementioned are very different. Oh yeah. Look, look, the, the, the joy for me, I mean, Bardo's not humble, like, you know, no, no. The joy for me is being able to adapt what I do to best, serve the needs of my analysts, especially on the TV side. Uh, radio is so much different because play-by-play on radio, radio is a play-by-play person's game. So I have to tell you more because there's not a score bug. You don't have pictures. I have to explain more of what's happening 
from a nuts and bolts standpoint, not from a scheme standpoint, that's their job. But from a nuts and bolts standpoint, I got to tell you the score. I got to tell you where the ball is. I gotta, so the versatility has to come on the TV side for me because, like you said, Stephen Bardo is not Robbie Hummel, is not Nick Ba, is not Mark Sanchez, is not whoever. Yeah. And I, one of the things I've always wanted to be able to be is versatile, whether it's versatile in the ability to call a bunch of sports or versatile in my ability to work with whomever I'm in the chair with. And what can I do to make them better? Because if they're better, the whole broadcast is better. And that's really the goal for me. The goal is always to make sure that the audience is served. Did the audience get to see what they needed to see? Did they see the pictures that they, you know, understand what happened in the game? Did the analysts get the chance to tell them why this or that was working? And if we walk away from it and that's happened, then it's a successful broadcast for me. That's the thing you always have to keep in mind is, yeah, this is all an ego play for all of us. We love, you know, having the chance to be on these games and it's a really cool thing. And I couldn't, I can't even imagine, I couldn't have imagined being able to do what I've been able to do when I was just starting out. It's but it. it's all, but it's all about the audience. You have to be able to, if, if they're not served by the broadcast, then it's not the broadcast you should have done. Now, maybe tonight isn't a, isn't a great example, but it is dollar beer night. And, and I know Georgetown. I will co- not have any beer. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> I know G- Georgetown <laughs> limps in right with, with the lone yeah. big East win. And so maybe being on the road, isn't a thing, but you're in all these arenas. You're talking about, being appreciative of the crowd since COVID and maybe it's the portal. Maybe it's the fact that we got accustomed to not playing in front of big crowds, but it has progressively gotten more difficult to win on the road. It is an, at an all time low this year, especially in college basketball. You're there. You're feeling the environment. Do you see environments wear on players? Do you see it get aware? Do you just think it's just simply more competitive? Well, I do think there is much more of a level competition, especially in the college basketball world, than we've seen in years past. And I think the transfer portal has been a big reason why you have teams that can get old quickly without actually having to go through the process of getting old. Nebraska got old quickly with a lot of new faces. They're an example of a team that obviously has not been able to win on the road, but they're an old team. And so they're able to get old. We see it with Purdue. They've gotten old the old-fashioned way. We see it with Northwestern. They have an old guard, which really helps anybody in the world of college basketball. I just The crowds are great, and, and the road thing is very weird this year because mm. it's just, it is just a it's – a, it's a, and, and I, our, our mutual friend Joel and I joke about this all the time. Every time something happens, we'll text each other and say – Hard to win on the road in the Big Ten because it is. It's just incredibly hard to win on the road in the Big Ten, and and it's and it's a weird phenomenon. And I and it and it's really throughout college basketball this year. Top ten teams going on the road against an unranked foe have a really low winning percentage. It's in the forty. The I think five, it's in the forty yeah. percent. It's in the forty percent tile. It's in the forties, and in the last five years combined, it's been like seventy eight percent. So this year. It's been a, and I want to say it's an anomaly, but I don't know that it is because I don't think we see dominant teams right now in college basketball. And I don't know that we're going to see dominant teams on the horizon. The transfer portal spreads talent. Mm -hmm. You know, you're sprinkling the talent throughout college basketball. Mm -hmm. So if you're that guy who waits behind Hunter Dickinson, for example, Terrace Reed at Michigan waited behind Hunter Dickinson to have a chance to play. And he's starting to develop the way big men used to develop. Slow, steady steps, climbing a ladder. But those guys don't stay now. You know, if you're, if you're waiting behind Hunter Dickinson after a freshman year, you're like, you know what, I'm leaving. I'm going somewhere else. And so that talent that would have developed at Michigan maybe develops at Duke or maybe it develops at Nebraska or somewhere else. Now, Reed stayed, but there's a lot of examples of guys like him who don't stay anymore because there's just no reason to. Somebody's going to see you and go, hey, I'll give you 200 grand if you come here. Okay, great. I'm going to go over there, make 200 grand, and develop there. All right. That's mm. the free market that we've established right now in college basketball. But I do think it has a tendency to level the playing field much more significantly than anything we've ever seen in college hoops. Kevin, I- I'm, I'm curious what you think about Ed Cooley and Georgetown. I, I know one of my, I don't know if concerns, but thoughts about when he mo- made that move was, okay, is he going to be able to 
upgrade his recruiting at a place like Georgetown and have access to greater talent? Or is this just kind of the guy he wants? Obviously, in season one, things have not gone uh, anywhere close to probably how he planned for. Uh, what do you think the future in terms of his trajectory at Georgetown holds is after seeing how much he struggled in, in his first year? I, I do think there is an upward trajectory after this year. I really do. I, I think they are set financially. I think there's a ton of financial support behind Ed Cooley, not just in his salary, but in his ability to go get players. And so he's going to have the chance to get whoever he wants. Now, there's no guarantee that they're going to go there, mm -hmm. but he's going to have a real fighting chance to draw in players. And that's step one in the current environment of college basketball. You've got to be able to draw players in with whatever NIL money needs to be there. And I'm convinced, talking to people around the Georgetown program, that that money is there. That money is there, and it can be there to help Ed Cooley. I think Ed Cooley is a fantastic basketball coach. I think he's, a, he's adaptable to the times. I think he's adapted his style for what you need to reach the current athlete, especially in this environment. I think he's incredibly smart. And I don't know too many people outside of the Providence area that don't like Ed Cooley. I mean, he's just an incredibly <laughs> likable individual, out, again, outside of Providence, Rhode Island. But I, I really think that is a recipe to get Georgetown to whatever level Georgetown can be. Now, I don't know what that level is anymore. That, that program bottomed out, and they may have waited a year or two too long to make the move with Patrick Ewing. But again, that's the challenge when you hire a legend is what do you do with him when it doesn't go well? It was one of the reasons I never wanted the Cubs to hire Ryan Sandberg as their manager because I never wanted to see Ryan Sandberg get fired. You know, one of your childhood heroes gets shown the door. And that's the case for a lot of Georgetown people. None of them wanted to see Patrick Ewing fail. I mean, you know, I think Nebraska fans can relate to this in a certain way about a guy coming home and not wanting him to fail and then ultimately seeing it fail. So there's, there's, a, there's a level you can get to with Georgetown. Is it where Coach Thompson had them as national title contenders? I don't know. It's a different Big East. It's a different college landscape. But I do think Ed Cooley can get them certainly better than they are right now. Can you do you get a feel because we're going to get into this conversation later, especially with regards to kind of like players of the year. And and we talked briefly yesterday about conference strength. Can you get a feel when you're doing these broadcasts from 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 top to bottom conference talent? I, I tried to make the case that maybe I know most people have like the Big East, let's say fifth or sixth right in their ranking. But if you get rid of, you know, Georgetown and. You got two bottom feeders, right? That pull the conference down, or correct Georgetown can, and DePaul. It, it, or you know, if you can, you get a feel when you're watching broadcasts over overall conference strength. Here and and here's the challenging thing: yes and no. Okay. For example, let's stack these two together. Let's stack the Big East against the Big Ten. Each conference has a team at the top that I think could win a national championship. I think Purdue fixed some of the deficiencies that they had last year that knocked them out as a one seed in the 16, they, they can hit the three now. They can hit outside shots when Edie is post-trapped and doubled. They can, it, they can get it outside and hit shots. They've got Lance Jones, who's a terrific defender, as well as a slasher and a scorer. So they've got a lot of those pieces that they didn't necessarily have when the recipe was found last year in the tournament to beat them as a 16 seed. So you stack those two. UConn, I think, is the best team in college basketball right now. Purdue is a very close second. You've got those two teams right at the top of the list. Mm. Then you look at the middles, the second and third teams in the league, Illinois versus, you know, look at the Big East's top two or three, Marquette, Creighton, whoever you think is that team that goes into the mix at the end of the season. Michigan State's in the middle, the, the big middles. Do you like a Providence versus a Michigan State? Do you like a Providence versus a Wisconsin? How do you stack the middles together? Because to me, that's where conference strength lies. And I realize we don't have equal numbers in these two conferences to go apples to apples. Right. But where do you take the middle of the Big Ten and stack it up against the middle of the Big East? If you've taken out the top one or two teams and said, all right, these two teams are great. These two teams are great. Let's set them aside. What about the middle? I don't know that the Big Ten has the bottom that the Big East has because Georgetown and DePaul – lose to everybody in the Big Ten on a regular basis, just mm -hmm. like they are in the Big East. They're losing, they're losing to Ohio State. They're losing to Michigan, the two teams at the bottom. 
because those two teams have better talent. What uh, happened in Ann Arbor yeah. and Columbus? Like you, are you not shocked? Yeah. And I get it. Michigan was hurt early, but the, the, the Howard factor has worn really thin the last year and a half. It's, it's been a weird thing to watch. I, I think there's talent there, but the Doug McDaniel thing is just bizarre. Yeah. I've never seen anything like a road academic suspension. Uh, it makes no sense to me at all. Andy Katz found out last week that basically Doug has 12 hours a week that he could do basketball and he does those at home. And then he's on scout team when they prep for road games and that's it. So when you take a team and you take their leading scorer and the guy who drives the bus and you pull him off and put somebody else in that position on the road, things like what we saw this past weekend in Lincoln happen, you just get annihilated because you're just a totally different team. Ohio state's a puzzler to me. There's talent there. There really it's is. It's supposed to be a good job. Yeah, and I, I the problem with Ohio State is that that fan base is fickle. They're not showing up right now. They, I mean, it is that. And and look, Thad Mata had some national title t- contending teams there, right? And they came for those. But if they weren't in the picture for that, they didn't show up at the regular. We get spoiled around here with Nebraska and Creighton fans who show up every single time to watch their teams play. That's not the case in Columbus. That's not the case in Ann Arbor. Those are schools that really are trying to get people in the door, and they're not succeeding right now for basketball. That's Kevin Kugler. He's the play-by-play voice for everything. He's You're on the Georgetown Creighton call tonight, right? I am indeed. A Georgetown Creighton tonight, but lunch first maybe with Damon Benning, <laughs> although it sounds like that might be over. Uh, 10.40, shoot around, 10.30. You going to watch? Yeah, I'll, I will, we'll go to lunch after the first shoot, and then I'll go down to Creighton shoot, and then I'll put on a suit and – I'll do a game, and then I'll hop on a plane tomorrow, and I'll go do another game. Wow. There you go. See you soon, champ. Appreciate you. Talk to you soon. He's the man. Coming up next, we got more Herd at Sports Radio. We're halfway through the show here on Herd at Sports Radio and 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. We are also live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. DB here with me. I'm Ravi Lula, and we are looking live. We are looking live. Well, if you're on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube, you're looking live at us. Who was just show. making the case for Musburger to be an HOFer? Uh, I think Nance was. I was think. it Nance? I think it was. Yeah, it was Nance. Yeah. Because he's like, he did more for the game than, yeah. you know, and growing the game. Is 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 he blackballed? M- Musburger? Yeah. Uh, no, I think he took a deal with like a Vegas casino. No, I understand that, but he's a slam dunk, right? Like, oh, why else wouldn't he be in? Yeah, I don't know. that. I mean, it might be because they don't like Shane, that's your guy. No, that was Severe's guy. <laughs> but he should be a slam dunk i mean why i mean i totally agree but he's not my guy i associate and this is probably he, an I, age thing robbie took my guy who's my who's your guy because oh, Mus, musburger was is the play-by-play guy for the raiders and there's the former raider guy is the play-by-play guy for the 40 for in san francisco yeah. i i always associate I musburger more with college football just but that's probably an age thing yeah. Like he is he's a very prominent college football voice for me and I don't associate him as much with the NFL. Yeah, so I'm just the opposite because yeah. of CBS today. Like the mm-hmm. with um Irv Cross and Musburger yeah. and Jimmy the Greek and um I almost referred to somebody's looks which is I don't think you can say in 2024. <laughs> oh, oh, so. Is Jimmy is Jimmy an HOF or he's not, is he? Jimmy the Greek? Yeah. Didn't yeah. he? Didn't he get? Didn't he have issues though? He got a little trouble. Uh, I think Babe Ruth is the only known. No, Honus Wagner is like the only known racist that I know is like celebrated in the Hall of Fame. Ah, uh, right? no, Ty Cobb. Ty Cobb, very. Racist. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't remember what his issues. Ty are. Cobb was aggressively racist. But here's the thing. I. It was a different time. Is that what hot you're take. Say? Hot take. Is yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think after the civil rights bill was passed, you probably should understand time and place. I, I excuse the guys in the 18 and 19, so, early 1900s. Uh, hot take. I actually don't think that's a terribly hot take. Like, yeah. it's still wrong. Right. But I think you do have to take in the context Yeah, like, of the I, can, I can understand it. Like, when I go watch movies from, like, the early to mid-2000s, they say some words in those movies that today, it's like, hey, don't say that word. You will get canceled. <laughs> you can't say it. It's not a nice word to say. Hey, but you, you go that, back and look at those. Can you do that delivery again? Hey, hey, don't say those words. Jimmy, um, Jimmy, Jimmy. 
You know what I mean? And it's like, okay, you knew at the time maybe it wasn't the nicest thing to say, but you didn't realize at the right. time how bad it was to say. Like, yeah, like in 2004, we were saying some words that we shouldn't have said. Hey, so Shane, as a society, who's fish that had this? I can't believe I'm drawing a blank. That had to sit down. Was it camp? And it was. It was somebody that said that why why the brothers aren't managers, and they were doing the sit down with Ted Koppel. Oh, um, like it's it, not Bud Hewn, is it? No. Oh, wow. <laughs> no. That that was the commissioner, right? Yeah, yeah, at one point. Okay. But can those, like, know. are those guys Bud, HOFers? Bud Kuhn sounds like a, the name of a guy that would be racist. I don't know. Do, do you remember who I'm talking to? It was, it was super popular. Um, and I'm drawing Just because you have the position well, doesn't mean you're an HOF. While you think of that, uh, I want to tell you, you should go out to supernovas.com and get tickets for Sunday's match against the Orlando Valkyries. Omaha able to get a win last night, three sets to one. They go back on the road Thursday to Vegas, and then they're back home here. Omaha, CHI Health Center, 5 p.m. on Sunday. There's no more football. Go watch pro professional volleyball here in Omaha, Nebraska. That's supernovas.com to get your tickets. Do you, um, know, do you know what a Valkyrie is? Yeah, it's like the Viking warrior goddess it's, uh, ladies, right? Specifically, it's... One of Odin's twelve handmaidens. I mostly just know. I love. It. I love mythology. I'm more into like Greek and Roman than I am Norse. Uh, but I. Oh. Well, I mean, you got the you know the Latin on the arm and stuff. Mr. Smarty Pants um, over there. I. <laughs> but I know most of what I know about Norse mythology from uh, Thor movies. Yeah. If I'm being totally honest, I know most. So that of may what or I may not be accurate from, from my brother. Fair. Totally He's, fair. He, Huge mythology guy. There we go. Um, Loved him some Thor. Listen, Thor's, uh, he grew on me, although I didn't like the last one. The last one was bad. Yeah, Love and Thunder, not a good movie. I'm not sitting through a comedy. But you liked, although it, one of you the liked things... it when he was on Earth playing video games, though? Well, you know. Yeah. Like well, Endgame? Yeah, that was a good movie. One of the things that I was doing while I was contemplating co collecting unemployment. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I watched Luke Cage. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know, that? I actually kind of liked it. Yeah. But I didn't get into like the Daredevil, the Jessica Jones. Like I'm like four years late. Some people like really ride for those Netflix, like Marvel series. I thought Echo was fantastic. I haven't watched that one. Yeah, she was, even though she woke Daredevil and that's my guy. But I was like, come on now. I got a closet thing for Daredevil. Well, hey, like he's okay. one of my favorite superheroes. I'm one of the only probably like seven people in the world that don't hate the bat ben affleck movie oh no i don't either so we're two of the seven people in the world oh i hey full <laughs> disclosure <laughs> us and our four listeners yeah oh, good to see amazing daniel with us now um i've re-watched that oh yeah multiple yeah. times yeah and not just because i used to have a crush on jennifer gardner overrated but so i get the it electric movie I, good? I mean i was like i was in high school no i know old, i don't you know. judge it's coming I, right off the alien I had a little, you know, listen, I had a little crush on Jennifer Garner. I was like, mm, don't te hate this movie. Te teach their own. Don't hate this movie. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a fantastic show. Yeah, it's not. It's 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 solid. I, I know people love the Daredevil. I like show. Colin Farrell. I do too. I thought Colin Farrell, and I love Michael Clark Duncan. Michael Clark Duncan's like one of my all-time favorites. I all think right. we should give Ravi props for saying the multi-name guy with his name with the in the proper order. I don't know how many times I've said Michael Clark, Michael Duncan Clark. <laughs> You remember those days, Shane? Yeah. I remember those days. <laughs> all right, uh, all right, all right. RIP to our guys. RIP to the pour one out for MCD. Yeah, the better kingpin though is Diafornio. Uh D'Onofrio. D'Onofrio. There you go. Leonardo. <laughs> Vincent. <laughs> Law and Order. <laughs> Let's just, full metal jacket. There we go. There we go. There we no, go. No, he's I I love him. No, he's he's really good. He was in the uh, Spider Man movie as Kingpin. I, th I think he's one of the most underappreciated actors. Of really, his, really good actor. He's he's pretty amazing, and he can fluctuate weight yeah. too, like nobody. Oh, ever like seen crazy! Him. The little guy, the big yeah. guy. And Isn't he the alien in uh, the original Men in Black? Shane, yes, the Roach, the guy that turned yeah, into yeah, a Roach. Yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, yeah. There's that better. Yeah, yeah no, Ex exactly. <laughs> hey, so you've been on that guy for a minute. For, yeah. 100%. Thank you, Shane. Good memory. That's why I know, that's why I love the fact you've known me a quarter of my life. Um, wait, almost half. Oh, 05. It's been a minute. 
almost half. That's only 36. <laughs> 16 years. I wish. No, I don't. <laughs> Not going back to my 30s. Bad guy. Um, <laughs> right in the sweet spot for me. <laughs> so you got a lot of improving to do. Uh, I, I hope so. Level of surprise that the news came out so quickly about Tony White. A- yeah. After after the weird... <laughs> Like seven minutes after our Text show ended. Exchange. <laughs> like seven minutes after our show ended. That was not the response I thought we were going to get no, when I reached out either. I did not. If you can't get up for this game, then you don't need you don't need to be here. I know, Coach White, man. You're my hero. Yeah, no, we, I I, we're, we're thrilled that Coach White, and we'll we'll have to get to this more in uh, her dad hot seat because we only have about a minute left here. But, uh, no, so, you know, you mentioned it's kind of funny because you, you said, hey, you know, the homecoming is not always what's cracked up to be. And they went the homecoming direction. Just I just felt guy. like he felt rushed. Probably. And maybe, I, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of the situation. And I don't know if you had more conversations. No, he didn't. Ex- he didn't. No, okay. he didn't expound. So I don't know, like, if there was an offer or interest there and he needed more time and they wanted to move faster than that. Like, I don't know how it played out, right, between him and Deshaun Foster and apparently P.J. Fleck and, and whatever. Um I think it's better for when an athletic director uses words like elite all the time. Are you thinking, oh, gosh, this has got Fleck written all over it? (laughs) To be fair, I do. And people in Minneapolis were generally concerned. And I knew he was kind of fibbing when he said no one had reached out because I know a couple of head coaches, they have the same agent. Yeah. Well, and I was like, I get it, the gamesmanship. But yeah, to be fair with the elite thing, our very own head coach, Matt Rule, likes that term a lot as well. That's not just a PJ Fleck thing. We just like Coach Rule better. We like PJ Fleck. We don't like the uh, quarter zip with the tie under it. That's not that's not the Nebraska vibe. Apparently, he, he was he was good in person. To us, so I don't have anything negative. To no, say. I think he's. I actually think it's a perception more than a reality thing with Coach Fleck. Uh, coming up next, though, we're going to talk some Super Bowl ads, commercials. Little underwhelming this year. We'll see oh, what Greg Anderson, CEO of Bailey Lowerman, has to say about it next on Herd at Sports Radio. Wrapping up our number two here on Fernat Sports Radio and 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. DB here with me. I'm Ravi Lula, and we're brought to you by the NDOT Highway Safety Office, reminding you that using your seatbelt saves lives and prevents injuries, but only if it's worn properly. Make it click. This message from the NDOT Highway Safety Office. Joining us. Now on the Warhorse Sportsbook Hotline is Greg Anderson, CEO of Bailey Lowerman, to discuss some of the ads we heard during the Super Bowl or saw during the Super Bowl, like we just heard that Dunkin' Donuts ad. Greg, how are you this morning? I'm fantastic. How are you all? Oh, we're hanging in there. Good to hear from you. Likewise. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Greg, I, I got to say, it seemed a little lackluster in the commercials this year in terms of really memorable ones. Obviously, that Dunkin' one sticks out, but... Um, kind of it just going back in your memory, was this kind of one of the more mass Super Bowl ad years? Uh, it really was. And I think that um, it sets out a bit of a cautionary tale for Super Bowl advertising going forward. And, you know, I think when you look at ads in the Super Bowl and the tone that they take, they are a direct reflection of what's happening in society. Yeah, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, the Super Bowl is, is meant to be a platform for brands to make a big statement right Mm -hmm. you know and you look back through the history of famous advertising like apple and their famous 1984 commercial or you know some of the work that nike has done it's supposed to be like a a reflection of things that are happening in society and they're making this this big uh statement or they're trying to disrupt a category but we really saw none of that this year and i think it's because we're in a really combustible societal time right now you know and and brands that have sort of stood out and made a statement oftentimes in the last 12 or 24 months have gotten dinged right they've been boycotted uh and everything else so i think the marketers this year tried to really play it safe uh and in playing it safe you know they spent seven seven and a half million dollars per 30 seconds to duck Greg, understated or overstated? Because I, I kind of got the reference and immediately I thought Bud Light, right? But it, it exactly. seems like they've weathered the storm, whether it was the partnership with the UFC and Dana White or uh, the, the, the public um, the, the, the public affinity from, from Donald Trump. What did we did was that exaggerated? We we read the reported losses, but it seems like 
now they're back, and it's still Bud Light, a very popular brand again. That did they rehab their image that quick, or was it overstated? Well, um, I think that there is like an initial period of shock, right, where everyone's talking about it. It's going to have an immediate short-term impact. But if you look at Bud Light, you look at Target, you look at Disney, you know, all of these brands have been on various boycott lists, and I think over time. Um, you know, people's sensibility takes over, uh, and then they could just go back to, um, you know, their, their no normal consumption patterns. We're talking with Greg Anderson, CEO of Bailey Lowerman, uh, talking about Super Bowl commercials. Uh, Greg, you know, I'm, I'm wondering because the thing that I noticed theme wise, and you mentioned this kind of in the, the state of the world, was it seems like there was a lot more commercials for causes as opposed to products. I guess, when did we start to see that shift? Because I remember it last year a little bit, but it was pretty prominent this year. Yeah, you know, cause advertising um, is always going to be there in these big moments. Um, there's obviously a massive audience, um, but I think, you know, cause brands are not immune from the same sort of... Um, Fragility, I would say, you know, as as any other you know product brand out there. Look at, um, you know, he gets us right. Um, oh was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, so yeah. <laughs> you, you want to talk about how divided and tense culture is in the United States today? You know, here's advertising that is trying to remind people that tolerance isn't a bad thing. And it was probably, it was one of the most talked about ads in the mm -hmm. Super Bowl, but it also had one of the largest percentages of negative sentiment in how people were talking about it. So, like, you do this for a living, so <laughs> you're the perfect guy to ask. How, like, it's 2024, and uh -huh. things are a lot, there's a lot more diversity overall. Opinions, the way people look, the way people dress working home from not home households like everything is less quote unquote traditional than like let's say it was 30 years ago 20 years ago even 10 years ago why do you th is it just that we have the ability to be more opinionated because why are we more particular mm. than like let's say we were in the 70s where there was a lot less quote unquote difference right uh, well, I think that political polarity, you know, unfortunately has, has taken over how people think and behave, you know, and uh, it shapes a lot of how they um, express themselves on various social media platforms today. Is this where you guys would excel, right? Because you, it's so temperamental and it, it volatile. You almost have to choose carefully, but we saw the expenditures this year for the Super Bowl. Was this simply Vegas, the high ticket prices, the it was ex, it was an exciting time, the Super Bowl performance, Taylor Swift, like did was it just the cost of doing business or is this just a sign of the degree of difficulty for businesses to get it right? Yeah, there is a very high degree of difficulty to get it right. I mean, marketers are spending millions and millions of dollars and the knock on effect of that investment. Uh, can be both massively positive or negative, you know, for a brand. So you really have to thread the needle, which is why you saw a lot of brands this year go to safe celebrity uh, driven, you know, narratives that got a few chuckles, you mm -hmm. know, and I think, again, you know, no one wanted to touch the electrified third rail of, of anything, you know, and unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and unfortunately they're everywhere. You know, and so I think it was a year where marketers really tried to play it safe. But, you know, going back to my original statement, I don't think you spend seven and a half million dollars for 30 seconds. And then, you know, how many other million for your celebrity endorser to play it safe? And I think that marketers are going to really start to question whether or not in this current environment, Super Bowl as a platform makes sense if they're just going to be forced to play it safe. Let, let me ask along those, God, this is fantastic, actually. Along those lines, do you think we're more uh, or less swayed when it comes to advertisements? It seems like now more than ever, mm -hmm. we have more resolve in our conviction. Like, <laughs> it seems kind of like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Are, can you get me to change my mind when seconds? I'm so staunch? <laughs> 
and what I believe in. Um, yeah, yes and no. I, you know, I don't know if it would be overnight, right? You know, but incrementalism, you know, we're trying to build awareness and we're trying to build meaning and, and specific attributes. But, you know, if you're talking about millennial or Gen Z's audience, going back to that cause thing, so many younger consumers are not just making a decision based on a product feature or price. They're making a decision about what a brand stands for in the world and whether or not that brand aligns to their values of how they live their lives. And so that's where you see a lot of like purpose driven, you know, brands and, you know, campaigns built around certain values. They're trying to align with their, with their audiences and those values. Mm. Great, great stuff there. We mm. super appreciate your time. And uh, I'm sure we'll circle around next year and, and oh, 100%. see what the conversation surrounding the ads are. Then we appreciate it, Greg. Hey, thanks very much for having me on. Thanks, Greg. That's Greg Anderson, yeah. CEO of Bailey Lowerman. I always wonder what the dynamics is, right? Where what's what's the breaking point? Because 98% of the time, we don't even watch commercials. The whole streaming platform mm -hmm. and television viewing experience is built around being able to do away with commercials. Mm -hmm. We don't want to see it. It's a waste of time. It can't change the way we think. Well, why do you see this? Why it's do you our think phones too, right? Because instead of watching a commercial, we bring up TikTok or we bring up Instagram or we bring up Twitter. Like a lot of times, this is what I do during games is commercial break. Oh, time for me to tweet out what I thought about what just happened or whatever, right? Yeah. Like as kind of what we do, what we do. So it is kind of the one time a year we even pay attention to yes. advertisements in a like real way. It's got to start to you think if we're getting a pulse on how people actually think and the way society is going, mm -hmm. wouldn't we see less commercials and not more? I think you're going to see less of certain types of commercials. That's why I think you saw so many movie trailers during the Super Bowl because they want to get their that actually does provide bang for their buck, right? Because seven million dollars on a production budget of like Dune, I think is like 150 million, 200 million dollar movie, right? Seven million dollars in advertising is nothing. You That's really good bang for your buck if you're an advertiser because, hey, you want to get this in front of as many eyeballs as possible. Mm -hmm. And all you're paying is for the time. You're not paying to actually produce the commercial, really. You just have to cut that thing up. I think that we're going to see more and more stuff like that. Ads for movies, ads for shows. Because again, in the streaming world, like you talked about, all they want is to push you to the platform, right? So you're going to see Netflix, HBO Max, movies, all that kind of stuff, because they don't care if you buy their product or they don't care if they buy you buy a product. They want you to buy their platform, mm. right? So it's a totally different dynamic. The commercial is an ends to a means for those people. Whereas how am I going to know if I want Snuggle or Windex or I mean, is anybody going to Dunkin this morning instead of Starbucks or Scooters or wherever just because no, I agree. of Ben Affleck on Sunday? I agree. Probably not. Coming up next, we've got our guy Matt D. Marines from the White and Blue Review here on Herd Sports Radio. Kicking off hour number three here on Herd Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities, as well as KFOR in Lincoln for this hour number three. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube as well. I'm Ravi Lula, DB here with me, and one of our favorites joining us now on the War Horse Sportsbook Hotline is our guy. Matt D. Marinas from the White and Blue Review. What's up, Matty? What's up, boys? How are we doing? <laughs> How are we doing? Good to have you guys back. I thought about uh, breaking in with, like, love story, you know? <laughs> I, didn't watch, I, think, I was like, hold up. I think that's a copyright thing. So you probably can't do so. I was like... I don't want to get you taken off the air trying to, like, celebrate your return and all that. But I'm glad you guys are back together, though. Appreciate it. Impressed or no that Ravi was texting during the super bowl um i mean mad that he wasn't texting me so. <laughs> no i was in your group yeah we were in the, i was in a little dm chat i was texting you guys back so, yeah that's true we were in the dm that's true, that's true. he was sliding in there um <laughs> no i mean i guess I, I i'm not surprised i didn't figure he was a commercial guy he's like a, you know just give me my football and leave me alone kind of guy i was i was just I knew he was excited about Monday, but I'm not going to lie. I was a little worried he made no show. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if, think, uh, if it wasn't the reunion show, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I'm out. 
in in uh in just to tie it to Creighton, which I'm sure we're gonna talk a little bit about, but like Stephen Ashworth's official prediction was that Brock Purdy was gonna throw a pick to lose the game, and that I think that first like first play of overtime when that ball got tipped over the middle and yeah. just barely, barely Debo should have like, caught oh, that God. though. He could have. That was a dime. Was like that was a great throw. Yeah, I thought Purdy played well. I uh, I thought Shanahan did not coach well. Um, but, but I don't, I don't hang that on Purdy. Like I thought he played really, really made good plays, made good throws, gave his team a chance to win, which is what you're supposed to do as a quarterback, right? So, yeah, I don't, I don't hang that on him. Like there's, there's a couple of weird injuries and some weird play calling that I think let Kansas City kind of stay in the game. And obviously the muff punt was like the, the, that just flipped the whole thing. So. Yeah. With that prediction, Stephen Ashworth knows that Brock and Chubb are different people, right? <laughs> <laughs> I th- like the Mahomes train is weird, man. Like, no, you can't mess with him now. No, nope. like, you're going against, you're going against Patty. Like, you're just like an enemy of the state at this point, because like, yeah, people people are. He's got that like fan base now that's like rabid. And you know the funny thing is, is for the most part. He's done it the right way for his high profile and as much fawning as we do. He hasn't had a ton of like social media or public missteps. He's his family's no. his only issue. Like the people and, around and, him and are his only issue. And you know what? Issue. He can he somehow doesn't absorb that. Yeah, it, it kind of it's got Teflon off. Of it's him. the it's on the periphery. Like I don't know how he does it, but he I'm pretty impressed. No, for sure. Because, like, that's the one thing in this, um, you know, when you grow up in a social media era, I guess, like he did, right? Like, you figure he's more susceptible to just stepping in it a few times, and he just doesn't. Like, he's just, he just does his thing, and everyone around him seems to step in it. <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't, yeah, like you said, it just bounces off of him, you know? Because I, I just don't think he lets it phase him. There's been a few moments where he's kind of come unglued a little bit, but I think that's just, but it's all it's football crazy. stuff, right? It's all like sideline stuff. Yeah, it's competitiveness. Like yeah, I don't, I don't hold that against someone of that level of that caliber. You know what I mean? I, I kind of understand that's baked into it. So, um, no, I agree. He's he's, he's going to be the face of the league for a long time. So love him or hate him, you kind of it's like it's like the Brady thing. You better just get used to it because you're going to be seeing him around a lot. Is it? Do you think it's kind? of – Does he strike you as like antisocial? Because if he is, that would make a lot of sense. He doesn't, he doesn't give you a ton behind the mic, so I think there's maybe part of that that he doesn't. Like he's embrace, just not out there, but he just doesn't. Like he almost reminds me of. He's you know, very. He's under. He's got a lot of self control. Like you remember, uh, like Doug McDermott at Creighton, where like he just wanted to play basketball. Like that's the only thing that he cared about. He was never like out and about for very much. Like he just, and he really didn't step in it. Like he might have been the most famous person in the city for a couple years there, and which I get is a different scale, right? But really didn't have you didn't hear any weird stories about him like doing stuff yeah. at a club or whatever like there really was nothing because most of the time he was just in the old gym shooting jumpers like that's pretty much all he was ever doing like i kind of get that sense from mahomes that like he's, he's like teflon right maddie it's like we don't care about we get mad at his wife we get mad at his brother we get his mad dad. at his brother we get mad at his dad it's all around him and he gives you nothing that you can hold him that's what i just don't personally think responsible i don't know that for. he does anything besides football yeah, it, that might be it. I mean, he's got two kids, so he might just be like, you know, he made a dad. he made the dad bod thing like popular. Well, who else is doing no. that, Leo? I kind of feel like that's who he might be. You know what I mean? He might just be like, I like to play football and I like to hang out with the with the kids. Like, as young as he is, that might just be who he is. You know, down to earth. You know, yeah. so I mean, because I don't know enough about him coming up before he, you know first out of the scene um, in KC. Like, I don't think he was like a high profile person before that. You know what I mean? So, um, cause he wasn't doing much of like note team wise at Texas tech. He was kind of just like, yeah, you know, we thought he was not one of those system guys. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I, I think it's just kind of who he is because that's kind of how he came up, you know, that's a little bit of a tease to um, a couple of questions I got for Ravi in our hot seat. Who's Matt DeMarinis' leader right now for player of the year in college basketball? In college basketball? Correct. Oh, Zach Eady. Like that's, he, 
Is that is that a debate nowadays? I don't even. I thought it was over. Is, is it? So he's the only person. Like he's he's, he's the only bad. he's the only guy with with negative odds. So he is the clear cut favorite. Mm-hmm. But does Purdue have to get over the hump for you? That's kind of I think what's still out there. Yeah, I, I I'm with. You. I can see where you're going with that for sure, but. I think it's going to be so clear cut in terms of how much he's a separator, you know, because he doesn't really, he's just impossible to account for. You know what I mean? He is the hardest player to guard on the floor for, you know, for reasons that he gets clowned for, but also for like, he's really skilled too. Like um, he's not just a big oaf out there, you know? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't even know if it's, I don't know who else would be in the conversation is my thing because I there's lots of good players out there and ones that in any other year could buy for it but well I, I mean you got awesome. so like popularity wise like Filipowski connect um you know I think Darren Holmes is still a little too obscure at Dayton but like RJ Davis Hunter Dickinson yeah. is a guy going for double doubles Kansas could make a run I've watched Kansas a lot. Does Dickinson really do it for you guys? Like, is that it does? I mean, so Caleb said something like, "We're watching Kansas last night," and he was, uh, and he's he said something that was kind of odd, but it was in passing, so I didn't pay him any mind, of course, because why <laughs> why would I talk to your own kid? But he goes, "Gosh, it just seems like he's the beneficiary of a lot of what's going on around him, not just about him." Mm. Yo, like that's why I should just come on every every time I come on, but. <laughs> Doing the truth bombs, like, see ya. Just tosses that grenade. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> I, I, I swear, I think I've sent you multiple things with some Caleb. Where I'm like, I think this dude is just like spot on. I don't think I would disagree with him at all. Like, I, I'm with him. I, 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 I don't get it from, like, I don't think he's a bad player by any stretch or overrated or anything. I just don't, I don't think he's, he's just not that guy. You know, yeah, I don't think he's on that, that pedestal. You know what I mean? I think he's just a good, Five man that like you know to cause problems matchup wise, but I don't think he's like on a ED call printer or clinging. I don't have him on that level. What what opinion. what about Jaden Ladee? Ooh, yeah, he's I like him a lot. He's a, um, like the Mount the probably Mount not West high is, profile enough to actually win it. Ooh, they San Diego State is legit, right? But like nationally, probably not high profile enough to win it. No, definitely not high profile enough. But I think you know there's there. There, yeah, he won't be in the conversation, but I think he's one of the more underrated ones. I would, I think he's better than Dickinson, for example. Like, I think. What about Tristan Newton? You know, That's right in our backyard. Yeah, Tristan Newton, I think is going to be like he's my front runner right now for Big East Player of the Year, even though like kind of Devin Carter gets a lot of the hype on social media because he's kind of like a one man show right now, and I think he belongs in the conversation. But I think Tristan Newton has been the guy from day one all the way through mm-hmm. that you know. Like I don't think UConn, I don't think UConn can win without him playing well, kind of thing. You know, as versatile I, 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 as I, they I, are, I, that's interesting. Yeah, I think he's the linchpin because he he's the guy who, on both ends of the floor, is a tone setter. You know, um, he sets everybody up offensively. He hits big shots. Um, he can rebound, facilitate, score, and then defensively, he can take your best best dude and make him miserable. You know what I mean? Like he just gets after him. He flies around. He plays hard. Uh, you know, he, he's just, yeah, he's a bulldog and it doesn't look, he doesn't look like a bulldog. That's the thing. Like he kind of looks unassuming. Um, hmm. but yeah, he's a stud in my opinion. I, 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 I think really highly of him. We're talking with Matt DeMarinas from the white and blue review. Uh, Maddie, let's switch gears here and go to Creighton. Um, obviously, you know, there's been some hand wringing, some consternation about kind of how the last stretch has gone. Obviously, losing to Butler, losing to Providence. Uh, obviously, those games could have gone either way. Really, haven't played poorly against anyone in a while, except that UConn game, which I think we all know why they played poorly there, because UConn's a little bit of a, a juggernaut here. Um, how? How do you gauge where you think they're 
at in terms of just their overall play? I know you've seen we've seen like Ashworth come on a little bit offensively, but it seems like maybe the defense has slid back. Like where would I don't know if I want you to give them a grade, but kind of where are they at in your mind compared to where you would want them to be heading in the middle of February? I've, I've been getting this. I've been getting this question a lot, actually. Like not just you know in this realm, but like. Well, I'm sorry for not oh. being original enough for you, Maddie. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's all good. I, it, it, Look at little brothers <laughs> mad at <laughs> clapping back at big brother. I, I like it. That's cute. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not. I'm not knocking you. I'm just saying. I, I, it makes me. This question makes me laugh a little bit. But you have to understand my point of view on this. Is I've been like, I don't just cover the men. I cover the women too. Mm-hmm. And so, like, right now, like they're 37 and 10. In we're going to Valentine's Day here. 37 and 10 between the two of them. So I've seen like a ton of winning a ton of good performances a ton of like amazing performances and then some that just like you know are mess but they either get the job done or they lose close and you're just like you're not really sending sounding an alarm off of it so i i understand that people latch on to a loss and just wonder like how many things on the checklist went wrong and i just i don't feel that right now and i understand 17 and 7 probably isn't what people and eight and five in the Big East probably isn't what people thought of this team because how much experience they had coming back and all that. But I just look around college basketball too, and I'm like, I still think they're one of the best teams in the country. Like, I don't, I don't think there's, I don't know if there's five to ten that you say, oh yeah, any night, no matter what, Creighton can't beat this team. You know what I mean? So I, I watched the Big Twelve, and I'm like, I think the best team in the Big Twelve right now, I don't, whoever you think it is. I won't argue. I think the best team in the Big 12 right now finishes behind Marquette, UConn, and Creighton. If you put like, if you said home road, I don't. Neutral, so on a on a neutral on a neutral them. site, let me just give you one, and I'm not I'm not debating, but I think that's interesting because. Mm. Uh, so on and a, on a neutral court, they play tomorrow. BYU and Creighton. You feel comfortable taking Creighton, and I'm and BYU is not even. You, you know what I mean? Like what I would consider. Yeah. Wh- wh- yeah, hundred percent. I'm with 100. percent Yeah, okay. I think Creighton's really. Good. I think I think I think Creighton's really good, and I think their best is capable of beating. You name it. I watched like, Houston I, I, the other night struggle offensively, and I was like, "Gosh, that'd be a good matchup for a team like Creighton." I've and, and Houston's 21. <laughs> what's what's Houston? 21 and three. I've watched Houston Something struggle like offensively for like four years. But do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah no, I know. So he may. He it's may worse be right. now. But he yeah. may be right. Uh, Maddie, that's what I'm saying. Like that's, uh, we all we, we all look at it from the Creighton lens. When we when we see them lose or we see them not do something at the at the highest level, or they see them like you know you lose at home to Butler and no one thought that was going to happen before the season started, right? And then you're like, gosh, why? Butler low key is not bad though. No, I no, know Butler's on fire right now. Like I know they and they're they, making they, shot like they. they I I did like, not see that coaching um, resurgence. <laughs> From like, Ada. yeah, like blowing by a guy like Neptune, who some of his peers really liked at the time of the hire. I agree. I think Robbie's more on the like, hey, let's talk about Neptune wagon. Which I <laughs> How long have I been talking? I've been talking about this like midway last year. Yeah, so Robbie was on that on me about that early. I didn't really feel it, and now I'm like, yeah, he might be on to something. My there. question but was, like, just, yeah. is Kyle Neptune actually good at this? And I don't know. Yeah, no. It's- no, it's time. Yeah, I think it's. I think there's enough. Like the uh, answer is leaning think, in the no direction, though, right? Like, for sure, for sure. But so, I'm with Damon. Like, I didn't think Dad was going to have like. I didn't think me neither. Gonna, well, I yeah, didn't either. I was, I was sitting behind the bench on. Uh, uh, I guarantee that was. Ohio State would take him back. You got Michigan and Ohio oh. State at the bottom of the conference yeah. in the Big Ten. Yep. I just yep, wonder sure. how. I, what I was worried about with with Mata wasn't that he couldn't coach anymore. I just didn't know if he'd have the energy for it. Cause like I'm sitting behind the bench at Butler and or against Butler and like, he's physically looks like he's in pain. Like he's mm-hmm. limping around. Like he doesn't like, he almost looks like late stage Phil Jackson a little bit, the way he walks around and stuff. Yeah. And you're just like, I, that's why I was like, I don't know if this is going to work at Butler. It's not, yeah. it wasn't as accurate well, for the record. You don't smoke peyote. <clears throat> it's Phil Jackson. He doesn't, or I don't. <laughs> Matt, Matt, let me ask you. You don't something. know what I do when I leave here. 
<laughs> Matt, let me ask you something. Yeah. Of these I, jobs that are supposed to be like good, I, the Ohio State thing is just sticking in my craw. Yeah. But mm. I'm looking at DePaul. I've heard for years. Oh, man. Sleeping, sleeping giant. giant. <laughs> they just got to lock down Chicago. There's, there's like De- nobody else is recruiting there. <laughs> there's DePaul. There's Georgetown. And there's Ohio State. Remember when Ohio State came calling and there was all the the circulation and rumors swirling about Mac, this, that, and the other. That wasn't rumors. That was no. Real. I get it. Yeah, I understand. I'm not real. trying to put Coach Mac's business out there, but I mean, it was reported. I'm not putting his business out there. Fact, rank those jobs for me real quick, Matt. In terms of I going forward, not who they've been, but relative to where they are, the conference they're playing in. Give me rank Georgetown, DePaul, and Ohio State for me. You can even talk about, you can even factor in expectation levels in mm. terms of taking the job because I think that actually matters more than people think. Oh, it I does. think it matters a ton. Yeah, I think uh, I don't feel it with Georgetown. I know that's kind of like the rub is that, oh, you know, they're, you know, once they, once it's built, it'll, everything else will fall in place because it of its history. And I just don't. I don't feel it. They've always been that team that just never draws any fans. Um, at least in the time that I've known them, like and a high exp- you know, and yeah, it's reasonable. I, I don't a know lot how like A and M and Ohio State. I, I think their like fan base always, expects them to win. Yeah, I feel like they've always been toxic because even when they had some good teams mm. early on, new like era of the Big East, like they were always like fire this bum. You know what I mean? Like they just don't. It's never good enough. So I don't think Georgetown is in a place where they. can. They to be fair, though, JT3 fight. was a bad coach. Like, that wasn't a bad take. Remember some of those fans. halftime cut in? I know, but like, he was a bad I, coach. Like, I, like he had a ton I, of talent for a while, but JT3 could never coach. That, I don't know about that, man. I he do. An I, listen, come on. His, his system his system of doing things eventually got... What system? He didn't have a system. <laughs> no, he did. He had the, yeah, he ran that Princeton offense that was, like, popular in the, like, you know... 30s? Late 80s, early 90s, all the way through... I mean, yeah, 30s too, but like I'm just saying, like that. Just out here running he, four corners offense, like he doesn't have a shot clock. So it wasn't too long. What's wrong with that, though? All right, but <laughs> listen. <laughs> so, like, who's I, suppo- I, who, who think, should be Ohio good State relative to, to supposed? Like, did anybody see Michigan? You're in Ann Arbor. It's Michigan. And I feel like it, Trey Burks wasn't that long ago, right? About Georgetown Final Four wasn't that long ago. Like Sullinger and, and Mata in that run for Ohio State wasn't that wasn't that long ago. Yeah, like what? I mean, I don't I don't get I, how this happened. No, I don't either. But I also think when you're at places like that, you can fix it quick too. Okay. You know, I think so. That rules the ball out. That, like like because I'm yeah. not sure it's the same thing there. But they do have the lowest expectation levels. But I also think if they actually made the right hire for the first time in their history, that it could be something really good. I, I don't, I don't, when I, when I've been to Marquette and I've been to DePaul, and I'm telling you, I don't see a difference mm. in terms of like how it feels around the community, um, the resources they kind of have at their disposals. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think Marquette's pulled way ahead now because they've been winning. Sure. Uh, and, but and infrastructure wise, it's not that big of a difference. Yeah. Like, feel like when you go to DePaul, you know, you're embedded in the city, man. It feels really like a cool vibe. You don't really feel like you're on a college campus. If you, and I know some people like that, you know, like it's not an intimate setting. It's a, it's kind of just embedded. In, it's baked into the whole city. So you get the full experience every single second you're there, you know. I'm not, so, tr- I'm just not, I'm not trying to go all hot takey, but I feel like I was hoping you said Ohio State because that, those basketball expectations feel a lot to me like let's say a and m's football expectations like i just yeah, think it, it just it almost feels impossible to be as good as that what Ohio they feel State? like that athletic budget mm, justifies justifies see i think georgetown's the best of those three jobs what? oh really i think georgetown is the best of those three jobs because you have access to talent because of your history and where you're at there's a ton of talent in that area there's not a ton unlike chicago there's not as much attention on the DMV. I know people recruit there. Don't get me wrong. But there's a ton of talent there. You are kind of the big deal there in terms of basketball. I know Maryland's there, but Maryland hasn't been special. You've We just heard Kugler talk about their resources and their commitment with NIL and stuff like that and Cooley's salary. And here's what I think matters more than anything, why that's a better job than Ohio State. Ohio State is a football school forever. 
no matter how good you are, no matter how good that model was. They could have won a national title with Greg Oden, and they still would have been talking about how they didn't beat Michigan in football that year. Like, that's what the Ohio State is. You win at Georgetown, you rule that place. Here's my, here's I, my, I think Georgetown's a better I, job. I, I agree with you on your point. Here's my problem, and I feel this way too. I don't feel a little uncomfortable saying it because Kayla's about to walk into it. But, like, I feel like sometimes you get to a point where you're too big. You know, you talk about, like, too big to fail. I think sometimes you get to a point where you're too big to succeed because there's so much angst around, you know, returning to that level. Like, that Ryan, I, like Ryan Day at Ohio State. There's so – right. There's so much pressure. Dude wins that, a ton mm-hmm. for people to be you mad at him. <laughs> yeah. Can't even enjoy the process of building it and winning incrementally to get to that stage because every win that you have in that in that journey is like, yeah, well, you're supposed to beat that team. I don't want to hear about that. You know what I mean? But I think like Georgetown, if, like Nebraska, Nebraska out there, like has gotten Louisiana so Tech, far like, down that they do appre- no, they would appreciate. I don't um, think it changes. I think I think it's always present because the minute you get to that like doorstep then people immediately assume you're going to kick it down and never like and lock it behind you and never go back again. Mm. I think it's hard. I think it's really hard once you've been on top to fall back down and then get back on top. Uh, if you haven't been. Maddie, who has the best middle of the conference, the, the big 10 or the big East real quick here, like 30 seconds. Uh, big East. I, I'm not that's the middle of the big 10. Uh-oh. I think we look at middle of the pack. I think Big Twelve is the top. Kind of yeah, that's Matt DeMarinas from the White and Blue Review. Matty, we appreciate it as always. We will catch up with you again soon. Sorry for rambling, fellas. Thanks for the oh, time. You're good, Matty. Love it. I'm all good. That I was like a fun. The, I like com- the national. Yeah, that was a fun conversation with him. Uh, we'll be talking to Matty more as we get down to the uh, nuts and bolts here of college George basketball. Really? Season. I do. Hey, listen. I think Georgetown is the best of three jobs. Uh, coming up next, first ever heard at Hot Seat from my guy DB here. We'll see if we can get him a little uncomfortable with some of our questions on Heard at Sports Radio. Welcome back. <laughs> I'm, am I on? I don't, I don't oh, know. is he here. producing or Jay, like what's, what's going, going on? on? <laughs> oh, you guys, we're back. We're I'm back. not. I'm, am I on? Shane, did you did you miss me? No, I'm gonna, I know. can't hear anything, Shane. You can't, I, well, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, people move stuff around. Jay, I, I'm not. I can't I'm hear not anything in my you head should today. be able to hear stuff. I can hear you now. I can't hear me. In my so headset. when we were pulling up the things, I think I moved some of the. Uh oh. Okay, there we go. Hey, we're back. Yeah, there you go. Listen, it's day two. We're okay. I, so my man B Squared Voice reminded me uh, on Twitter. It was Al Campanis. We were talking yes. about earlier, which, and I couldn't remember the name. And I should have known. I'm like Dodger exec. Like I, but I mean that was in the prime of me being impressionable too. Yeah, because yeah. I was in. I I remember. I so was you were in, a kid. Yeah, I was in middle school. Yeah. Right. And, and the Dodgers were, were on a heck of a run. And, and I'd never heard an interviewer tell somebody, I think he used the word baloney. He, he said, I think baloney he said baloney and garbage. Yeah. He goes, you don't yeah, really a bunch that of garbage, do you? And he said, well, I mean, why do you think, you know, you know, black people aren't good swimmers? I don't think they have the buoyancy. And I was like, <laughs> I was just at Maple Village Pool. I love to swim. <laughs> You're like, I float real good. I t- uh, <laughs> I went over to my my buddy Cobb's Brian because he had a pool in our neighborhood. I was like, Brian, am I a good swimmer? <laughs> Is that why you beat me in basketball in the pool? It's not because you're six foot and I'm five like, three. But I beat you in basketball on land. You beat me in basketball in the pool. Oh, he was so good. Um, and when we get in the pool, and I felt like I was going to drown trying to play. If you don't know what we're talking about, you're going to have to listen back to the show. I don't even remember what segment we were talking about. But Al Campanis was a uh, flag. We were talking about racist. would something disqualify you from the Hall oh, of Fame? Oh, the Hall of Fame. The yeah. Hall of Fame. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know why you guys even went down that road. Be- uh, to make you uncomfortable, Shane. That's what we were doing. <laughs> I th- I think we said, is such and such a Hall of Would that discount you from being a Hall of Famer? Yeah, and then you brought up. I and brought I said, Ty- well, there are there guys that like aren't good Wagner, guys that are, in, that are in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, and then that's how we got on Al Campanis.
whatever. I'm a I'm alive. I like in game betting. Do you? Yeah, I think you get better lines sometimes. You get better value. Yeah, you and Brian Edwards. I think you get a little. I think you get a little juice there sometimes. He's a, he's he's. Or if that's, you, that's his jam. Or if you don't know how uh, how the vibe of a game is going to go, you can learn a lot in that first four minutes or so, especially basketball. Man, I, I enjoy a nice live bet. You can do that at Horseman's Park in Omaha or the casino at Warhorse Sportsbook in Lincoln. Warhorse Sportsbook, no bets, no glory. It's time for my, her. My, my man, uh, Al Campanis, would have been upset. My man, Kobe Bretz, was a great swimmer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Larry. <laughs> it's time. For, he was. It's time for her that hot seat. The, the seat already <laughs> feels a little hot, if I'm being honest. Um, <laughs> but I can swim. What are you sitting on a seat warmer too? Uh, no, I just got a little cushion here, which is nice. Helps helps uh, you know helps to be comfortable while we're little, doing the show here. A little more cushion for the pushing. Um, but we are. I'm just gonna ride put, right put, on by that. Put pushing you around, uh, <laughs> or vice versa. It's time. You tried to bully D Marinas. Who me? Yes. About what? You strong. You tried to strong arm him with some of your hot takes. Well, about what? Well, the best job. The uh, I think Georgetown is the best job out of those three that you gave. I think Georgetown is the best job. Still, I firmly believe. If if I, I think they still have a lot of things in common. If what Kugler says is true, because the only thing I didn't know about or that I haven't known personally about Georgetown is okay. What's their NIL set up? What's the money set up? What's the resources? And I'm I'm basing this off what Kugler told us that like the money's there for Cooley, the money's there for NIL. Like if the if the that part is there, Georgetown is the best of those three three jobs. I wonder how close he was because the in my circles the rumor was is that Prescott Murphy was going with Cooley mm. to to Georgetown instead of going to Bama. Yeah, because but he had to wait till June one. But you can obviously yeah talk about that deal before uh, right. that had to happen. Yeah, but, and then but then Preston. I mean, either either is a good spot for him. I think. I mean, can you imagine Murphy at if, Georgetown? If if Cooley could get the guys that Preston can get, then Georgetown is real scary. Yeah, I because I get the sense that Coach Mack thinks very very highly of how well rounded Preston is. Yeah, as a I, recruiter, a I coach, agree. a drill guy. I like, have I have nothing but good things to say about Preston Murphy. Yeah, I, I didn't interact with him a ton. But we did, uh, you know, we interacted some. Well, I was enough gyms, man. That guy was a kid. He's a grinder magnet. He's a grinder. Like that dude works incredibly hard. Was always super kind to me. Like when I was covering Creighton exclusively, like nothing bad to say about him. But real quick before we get to the hot seat, because one of the questions is similar, is setting up one of my hot seat questions for you. Mm -hmm. You don't get the sense that Ohio State basketball is a little like A and M football. Um, no, because I don't, I genuinely don't think Ohio state fans care about basketball in the same manner that Texas A&M fans care about football. Like it is not to me, it's not on the same. I, no, I could see that being a point. I don't know if that's a disqualifier. I think, I think it is. I think because I like, think like, how is Ohio state not better in baseball? Did you see the preseason rankings? Like how are they not better in baseball and basketball? Right. So I, I think there's, I get what you're saying on the Texas A&M comparison and be like, Hey, with all these resources, why aren't you better? But I think the, I think the actual job is different because the expectations of Texas A&M football, I think are way larger than the expectations of Ohio state basketball. I think the ex expectations of Ohio state football, and Texas A&M football are a lot closer, but Ohio State has justification for those expectations. As they and Texas A&M national champions doesn't really because they haven't won a real national title. I think ever if I've looked the ones they claim, there's like one in the 30s and one in the teens. Anything before the AP era, I do not count. So like if you're trying to claim 1920s national titles on me, like you can go. I'm not here. I'm not here for that. Texas A&M does not have a real national title in football. Mm. Ohio State is one of the most accomplished programs that we have. So expectations wise, I think they're similar, but Ohio State's are justified. I don't think Texas A&M football expectations and Ohio State basketball expectations are anywhere in the same neighborhood. So I think that that's a huge difference to me. But if you're asking the question of why aren't they better considering their resources, then yes, I'm on the same page as you. Okay. Um, you want to go first? You want me to go first? You got one? I got one. Let's go. With regards to National Player of the Year, mm. I've got a different I, guy. I, I give you the Big Ten Conference mm -hmm. or the field. 
who I think will win or who I what would you today if you had to be right for national if player, I have to be right for national player of the year mm-hmm. the Big Ten Conference so who are we talking about besides Edie there that's for you to figure out <laughs> so just Edie okay <laughs> well I I don't I don't th- unless you think you back a big Tyson Walker guy or Terrence Shannon Jr. sure I, although I, his off the court stuff is probably maybe a disqualifier maybe for voters I'm not you know. Maybe, but he's back playing. I know. And from all reports, not that I'm a. No, I know. I know what you're saying. I like. I'm not. I'm not sure what the wrong. I don't. I don't. It. It's nothing not, was substantiated. It's perception, not reality, right? Though the, the perception of what happened there, it's like 99. Do you feel somebody could get hot in the in the Big Ten conference? The field is the field, though. Edie is the only. If I, Edie is the only guy right now mm-hmm. with. With minus with favorable odds, if everybody I, else is plus money. If I have to be right, I'm going Big Ten. If I am going on who I think should win it, I'm taking the field. Who do you like? I like Dalton Connect. The story matters to me, right? Yeah. His story is better than anybody's. So, I, and I, he's performing. I he could make a serious run. He could. I just don't know that Tennessee has a high enough profile nationally. They're top 10 in the country. No, but like standing and profile are different. Like, I don't know that people pay enough attention to them nationally mm. as a basketball now program. They, they probably have a run in them. Probably. And so like maybe the SEC tournament run or late straight, because all that voting happens before NCAA tournament, right? So you get, you probably just get a conference tournament run. He kind of had a run earlier in this year where he scored 35 points or 30 points and like, four straight games or something. I don't remember what the actual numbers were, but he had like his little mini moment there. He probably needed to extend that a little longer, but what are you taking? Big 10 or the field? I'm going to take the field. Is there, who's, who's the name? Is it RJ Davis? No, I, I like Davis. Um, you know, connect is there. McCullers jr. Could make a run. Um, I, I think it's safer to take the field. Like, what if UConn all of a sudden just goes on and you get Tristan Newton. Newton's a, Newton's a dude. If I if it's anybody, I want it to be connect, but that's like a that's I want it to be him, right? Yeah. Go JUCO, go Northern Colorado, then you end up in a in a Palace you're conference a and you're, you're carrying your team. Like I like that. I like that. Uh coming up next, we got more Herd at Hot Seat here on Herd at Sports Radio. Welcome back as we wrap up the show here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities, and KFOR in Lincoln. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Those YouTube comments popping off as always. Ooh, Ken has an interesting one. He says, maybe Texas A&M football equals Illinois basketball. That's interesting. It is a little. When did D. Brown, when did those guys beat Carolina? Was that 05, 06? Uh, they lost to Carolina in 05 in the title game. That was the Sean May, Raymond I'm, Felton. I'm, I'm thinking they beat beat them too well not the title no i know en route um was it d brown's years that was d brown darren williams or darren Williams. Okay. head that's all the same team for illinois yeah what am i think i'm trying to think of their most recent run illinois yeah are you saying that with an s i was saying illinois apostrophe, apostrophe s. s like the pos- <laughs> possessing of illinois i wasn't saying like des moines or i anything. know you get <laughs> I was getting ready to go in, and I was like, ooh, I forgot he's going to bristle. <laughs> no, that's not what I said. I understand how the word is pronounced. You okay, DB? Hey, man, it was a possessive term. No, I, I understand. Um, stay I, stay I, away from you, academia. I think uh, I think Illinois might be close in terms of what I'm, how I view Texas A&M. In terms of Illinois basketball might be the closest corollary there. and Because they haven't gotten over that hump, but they've had like – runs and have we established what sport that school is illinois yeah i think they're a basketball school that wants to be a football school that's what i think Hmm. they're the opposite of kansas which is a or not the opposite of kansas but it's like they're a basketball school that really wants to be a basketball school and they're like (laughs) oh we'll finally i guess put a little bit of money into football so coach leipold doesn't leave but or a lot of money. They're doing a whole renovation. It's like a half billion dollars. Like they're putting real money. Yeah, into they're it. like they're just, putting real money. Yeah, it's not months. from the ground up. They're just yes, getting a facelift, um, which is what I think most schools will do from here on out. Yeah, the, you the, won't you the won't see those big erection are, projects are too much. 
Um, but I, I mean that I'll keep thinking on that, but I think that's in the neighborhood of what I'm talking about with Texas A&M. Junk Monk's taking the field. Yeah, he likes Newton. He likes Newton from which I could see. I could see Newton and I, UConn. I was a little surprised that Matt was so matter of fact. And I get he's On the ED. front runner. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Vegas, I mean, he's clear. He's the only he's guy a with dramatic minus. front runner. Yeah, yeah. But I don't believe that to be the. I don't. I think he is the front runner. I don't think it's as wide as the odds would indicate. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah. Especially like the problem with UConn is it feels more collaborative. I think. Like I, I get new, which again was I. It was interesting. I but I was kind of vibing with Matt though on the lunch pen. Sure, no, he's definitely like you know go Reggie Jackson on you like the straw that stirs the drink. But there's a lot of other pieces that people like on that team, whether it's Castle or Klingon or whatever. Right, I'm telling you though, Connect has the ability to take. He has the type of game you want to talk that about? could take the nation by storm. Yes, he's an he's like exciting. Yeah, the way he plays it, like he doesn't play exciting basketball. No, I know he plays very good basketball, but it is boring as all hell. And I and I I thought people. So the two things that I think could hurt Edie is I think people will say he gets the well, yeah, duh, he should do that. Yeah, he's so seven, people seven foot twelve. So of people course he will be dismissive of the actual twenty three and what is he twenty three and thirteen something like that. Yeah. And I think they want Purdue to like get out, to where get to where they need to be. Which like for him for their postseason, the run. voting isn't going to happen. I'm, it's close. It's within a month. No, but I mean, so like you're not going to know if Purdue overcame the NCAA mm -hmm. hurdle until after you voted. So to your point, I think last year actually hurts Edie because of what they did in the NCAA tournament, where they're like, eh, yeah, he dominates in the regular season, but. And you're not going to get to see the end of that sentence this year before you vote. Yeah. Jaden Ladee, like there's, if you, if you're a college, if you watch, if you really mm -hmm. watch college basketball, I think you can more than make the case. It's, Here's the problem though. Most voters don't. I don't know. I could see if We've in baseball. Seen, I mean, the Heisman is the biggest, is the biggest culprit here. A lot of those guys don't watch very many games outside of their region, Right. That's the problem. Is so a lot of people are so hyper focused on their I, I coverage. Think basketball player of the year gets a bad rap. I, I think, I think they get it right more often than not. I do too. But I also think it's more obvious more year, more often than not than it is this year. Mm. Edie's the obvious choice this year, but should he be? That's a fair question. Um, <laughs> TK, give it to the goggles kid out of Indiana State. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Can we say that? I just read it. He's I mean, goggles? there's nothing wrong I mean, he's with got goggles. goggles. No, yeah, that's no. not he's, like a, he's nice, though. Wearing goggles is not a protected class by, like, the ADA. Like, you're you're all right. I think you could um, say Indiana State. What do you it's know no about the ADA? Type 1 diabetes covered, baby. Wow. American Disabilities got, Act. You got, you got some range. Let's do it. So I have to know about the ADA just because of my, my background and my profession. Yeah, absolutely. Teaching. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. No, listen. my When I got diagnosed... My mom was like all up in that stuff, like as an advocate, yeah. because if you don't do it for your kids, nobody else will. Yeah. Right. And so like she made sure I was covered and protected. So I know all about the ADA since I was about seven years old. We are really going to take the Big Ten Conference, not the field. I listen. I If I have to be right, the Big Ten is the safe bet. You only get one guy, though. Yeah. The guy that is the odds on favorite. OK. And like it's not by a little bit. It's not like it's plus 300 plus 700. Right, he's minus seven hundred. The next guy's plus fifteen hundred. Yeah, like it's a big gap. If I, if it's who I think should win, I'm taking the field. If I, if I have to be right, I'm taking Big Ten. That's all. I, you know, listen, I'm a, I'm a risk analyst. Like that's what I do. Like I'm, I'm weighing my odds here. <laughs> What's the cost benefit? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually finally ask a, uh, a, a question here, uh, and I'll stick with basketball. Okay. You know, we're talking about college basketball this morning. And this is right in your wheelhouse. I'm watching Wake Forest and Duke last night, right? Mm -hmm. Our guy Hunter Salas out there doing his yeah, thing. Yeah, Oklahoma Tyler went. Did he? Yeah. Hunter, oh, that's Hunter, awesome. I know Hunter they're tight. Got, Hunter got him tickets, so he got, he. Uh, that's he, awesome. He took Trey out there. Shout out to our guy Oklahoma Tyler. I spent a lot of time with him on sidelines this year. We're getting human meathead. Um, <laughs> man after my own heart. Uh, <laughs> the Dana White of Omaha. <laughs> he does kind of look like him, doesn't he? <laughs> I could see him slap fighting somebody too. Nah, he was so cool. He was gonna go to 
Bellevue West because Mike had a tournament. Yeah. To go get Micah and bring him to us, I, so I didn't have to miss the beginning of senior night. Oh, that's cool. But then Micah's game got moved. But he's, he he was all in. He's like, a good dude. Like he, he he yeah. He comes off like a jerk. I know. He's a mis- good dude. Misunderstood. Though. Hey, he's like me. No. I'm <laughs> um, I actually am a jerk for people that don't know. Um, <laughs> but I'm watching Wake Forest and Duke last night. Yeah. And we're watching our guy Hunter Salas ball out a little bit uh, against Duke. Cameron Indoor. Yeah. Coming off dropping thirty the other day. And I can't help but think to myself. And I don't even know if this was a real possibility because I don't really think it was. Mm-hmm. What would this Creighton team look like if they had Hunter Salas? <sighs> Boy, they need an athletic wing. I'll say he fits. He fixes their biggest problem. And he can defend. He fixes their biggest problem, right? Uh, and I don't know if you still have Ashworth or not. I don't know. But if if you bring Ashworth off the bench, that becomes really interesting because you've got some you've got some help off the bench now. All of a sudden, you got to solve some of your little depth problems. I, he that would he'd be fantastic if if Hunter Salas was on Creighton. This is gonna, it's going to sound like hyperbole, but I don't think it is. Are they the best team in the country? Probably not. How close are they? Um, Legit top five? Th- probably they're the preseason buzz. Yeah, right. Like they're they're at the preseason buzz. Right. Yeah. I I could see that being a thing because he's an elite level defender. Yeah, got the size, got the length, can get to the rim in a way that no one really on Creighton can right now. Yeah. Can also, I mean, he can score at three levels. Remember when Gonzaga used to think he could only defend? Yeah, that was really dumb. The way his two years at Gonzaga were some but, of the but, dumbest but, things but I've I, ever but seen. I, but I will say this. I, I will say this because I'm not, few can coach. No, he can and, for sure. And so, but, but I he think, messed up on that. I, You know what I think we undersell? What's that? The freedom to make mistakes. Mm, I mean, I don't understand, but I know what you mean. But, you know, when you empower people to to go out and and not have to look over your not playing scared, you you can do amazing things. Yeah, uh, um, amazing things. Absolutely. And so, and I and that's I think the freedom that Hunter has with Forest. Forest, right? So yeah. I don't know if like that's is like should I assume that linear latitude with Mac? I think so. Okay. Because uh, Be- because you have because that's that's you have to earn it with Mac, right? Yeah. But we've seen that whether it's Ashworth, Shireman, could you Alexander, could you envision a Mitch Ballard, where Shireman and Hunter play together though? Yeah, they play different games. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think you'd get more of last year's Shireman now. Hunt does play with a guy that hunts shots for Wake. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But he doesn't dribble near as much. Well, last Baylor. year, neither did Baylor. I think you get last year's version of Baylor, which is a lesser version of Baylor. But I think you get a greater version of what you're getting from that other guard spot. Yeah, and I don't – I know sometimes Baylor drives some Jays fans crazy. Mm-hmm. But s- statistically, what he's been able he's to really, accomplish – He's really, really good. He's – like he, he's really, really good. He, he, you talk about giving latitude. I, I think that's you, what I mean. If you, you get, earn you got, it with you, Mac, yeah, you gotta, you gotta give him some latitude to do his thing. If you earn it, if you earn that trust with Mac, you earn that latitude with Mac, then you've got it. Like you never saw. I mean, whether you go Roggy, you want to go all the way back to Roggy, you want to go Mitch Ballack, you want to go yeah. Baylor Shireman. Like if you have earned his trust, he had you get as much latitude with Mac as you do with anybody. I think. Because some of those shots, you know he doesn't like. Yeah, and he doesn't I, – I feel better when he's doing it than, like, let's say, Casey. And I don't think it has anything to do with their size. I just have to – I just think it has more to do with my level of comfort and a positive result. He's oh, way so. more consistent. Yes. Well, I think Casey also kind of forces those things sometimes, whereas Baylor it feels much more natural. I don't know if it is or not, but that's just my when sense. When is shooting from 30 feet off the bounce natural? Hey, ask Jacob Padilla when I'm playing pick a ball with him back in the day. He knows it's natural. Uh, that's the show for today. We will be back what tomorrow. The- that's DB. I'm Get Robin JP Lula. over here. This is Herd at Sports Radio.